Didn't have time to prep. <laughs> there you go, Richard. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Richard, did I send you all the pictures from Saturday? No, I just saw uh, the one from. Uh... Oh, I'll send the rest. Okay, They're great. Wonderful. Did a big party on Saturday? Did you? We had a work party. We did our first sliver, our first uh, Nevada City sliver. Outdoor so, work party. Yeah. It was pretty exciting. Probably one of my best days as of being on council. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. It's, it's part of the hands-on, you know, it feels like we actually got something done that was positive. So. I don't know hands-on yet um, as a council member. <laughs> well, this was hands-on. <laughs> we'll introduce you, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I've got the COVID council funk. <laughs> Hi, Doug. What are you still doing here? I take her a walk downtown. Oh, oh you just And there's no water out now, so I bring Oh, hi. Oh. How old is he? Six. <laughs> He's oh. got crunchy ears. Yeah, oh, hi. Oh, hi, honey. Okay. Go, go. Go, go. He's got a little rain jacket. How cute. Is there a doggy? Oh, sorry, I'm not muted. <laughs> That's okay. Either are we. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just waiting for Katrina. And my clock says uh, 631. So. There she is. Unmute yourself, my dear. Yeah, I just did. I'm just trying to get um, YouTube up and it is up and then to, I'm printing out, I just got inundated with about 30 emails in the last 20 minutes. So I was oh, fun. Gone. For public comment? Yep, for public comment. Okay. I saw a few of them just come in, so. Me too. Okay, oh, so see. should we, I go ahead? Yep, we're, we are ready. YouTube's up and I've got it on record, so we're good. Okay, and everyone's here. Okay, um, welcome to the regular City of Nevada City Council meeting, Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. This City Council meeting convenes on the ancestral territories of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon Tribe and we support the restoration of their federal recognition. And moving on to roll call, please, Katrina. Uh, Mayor Manette. Here. Vice Mayor Strasser. Here. Council Member Fleming. Here. Council Member Fernandez. I'm here. Great, okay. And right now I would like to ask you all to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, of America and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Thank you. 
Okay, tonight we have a um, proclamation and, whoops, there it is. Okay, and just to say tonight our proclamation is for the Nevada County Food and Toy um, Run Day. And um, it doesn't say this in the proclamation, but they have really done an amazing job dealing with COVID issues this year, and I just want to acknowledge that they are taking every precaution to keep this program going. So, as of right now, I will read the proclamation. The Nevada County Food and Toy Run Day. Whereas the Nevada County Food and Toy Run Day celebrates its 29th year of bringing motorcyclists to the Gold Country on Saturday, December 12th, 2020. And whereas the Nevada County Food and Toy Run is both the Head Start and Big Brother Big Sisters single biggest event, and will be making sure that 400 plus families have a Christmas with food and toys this year for all. And whereas we will see participants on motorcycles being escorted from the R Eric Rood administration building at the government center through Nevada City, Grass Valley, and ending at the Nevada County Fairgrounds. Whereas the Nevada County Food and Toy Run has gained the trust and support of the city of Nevada City, the county of Nevada, and all branches of local law enforcement as they join in cooperation with the Toy Run organizers to make this a well-executed event. And whereas since the incep inception in 1991, the Nevada County Food and Toy Run has gained a reputation as the safest toy run in Northern California and one that has never been postponed or canceled. And whereas the Nevada County Food and Toy Run Board, Board of Directors are Tom Stazer, CEO, founder and founder, Ed Bornsky, Vice President, Michael Montgomery, CFO, and we thank them for their efforts by making so many family holidays brighter by having this wonderful event. Therefore, I, Aaron Minette, Mayor of Nevada City of Nevada City, County of Nevada, County of Nevada, State of California, hereby proclaim Sunday, December 12, 2020, Nevada County Food and Toy Run Day. So thank you. And Tom couldn't be here with us tonight, and we will make sure that he gets that. Okay. And right now is public comment. And how much, um, Katrina, how many public comments do we have? Uh, Dawn, how many would you say that are uh, not on the agenda? Um, a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'd say probably about uh, 40 or 50. Maybe. Um, so... I think I'm going to limit the public comment to two minutes. Um, okay, Don. Yeah, that's fine. Let me get my handy dandy timer going here. <clears throat> okay. So under the government code section 54954.3, members of the public are entitled to address the city council concerning any item within the city council subject matter jurisdiction. Comments on items not on the agenda are welcome at this time. Normally, public comments are limited to no more than three minutes, except for certain specific exceptions, and the city council is prohibited from discussing or taking action on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. And because we have so many public comments, I'm going to limit them to two minutes tonight. Thank you. Okay, Don. All righty, here we go. Uh, the first is from Polly Halstead, and she refers to Nevada City Orient Ordinance 9.14.040, obstruction of free movement in public ways and places. 
No person after having been reasonably notified by a police officer that he or she is in violation of the prohibition in this section shall willfully and maliciously obstruct the free movement of any person or any street, sidewalk, or other public place or on or in any place open to the public. The next is from Ken Page. Just wanted to thank you all for this. This is so amazing. Uh, she attached a photo. <laughs> I do hope this will become the new look for the city. Everyone's coming to Nevada City and eating at Tux is telling me that they want this to be the new look, outside dining. I want to help in any way possible to make this a reality. Let's take something good out of this crisis. You guys have provided me an opportunity to have dining when I, only, I can only operate at 50% inside. I'm doing this by faith, believing the investment will bless us so we can be a blessing to the community. In your allowing me to do this, I realize you have put yourself out on a limb and also losing revenue with the parking meters. I want to propose a plan that I will be able to compensate the city for the loss of your revenue for those two spaces. Here is my proposal to you if you will accept it. I believe your cost is $8 per meter per day. We have two meters, therefore $96 per week or $384 per month. Each month I will pay the city $384 when I hit my bottom line covering my cost. You have blessed me with this opportunity and I want to give back. As you know, the restaurants and all businesses have suffered. If they are like us, they have lost money for the past five months. It is my desire to help the community and move ahead. This crisis is causing us all to think outside the box, to move to outside dining. I hope we will be one that will remain long after the pandemic ends. Please let me know how I can help you spearhead other business to team up and find ways to bless each other. Right. <clears throat> um, so there's several that wrote basically the same thing, the ones I was able to look through ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to read the top one um, that had the most information from Amy Cobden, and then the others who reiterated um, almost word for word, but not exactly, um, were Amanda. Claire Poupo, Rachel Gicker, uh, Patricia Flynn Zalita, and Janine Singer. I am writing in support of enforcing stronger measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in downtown Nevada City and the county in general. Cases are on the rise all over the country, and just because we have been fortunate thus far to not have a heavy caseload in Nevada County is not a reason to relax our guard against it now. I understand that a group of restaurants in Nevada City and Grass Valley have filed suit against the city and county. Sorry, I forgot to set my timer. Hold on. <laughs> it's okay, keep going. Since you're reading for a whole bunch of people, please keep going. Okay, I feel terrible for the financial pressures that these businesses are suffering this year and understand their desire to find a means of staying open. However, as an experienced scientist, a downtown resident, and a community member, I am alarmed by the anti-science attitudes I am seeing from this group of restaurant owners and other members of the community. There is room to believe in science, have compassion for immunocompromised people, and to run a business responsibly. I think that we can all do better. Here are some things I'd like to see. One, more consistent unified signage in windows and on sidewalk easels, reminding pedestrians and shoppers to maintain a minimum or six of six feet of distance, it really should be more like 10, to wear their masks and to wear them properly, covering the mouth and nose. Two, consistent unified floor medallion stickers to place on business floors identifying where to stand. Three, hand sanitizer at every door to every business. Four, police officers and other city officials consistently wearing masks. I understand in the case of some police officers that they feel that seeing the mouth is important to their work. I understand this and encourage them to buy masks with clear material that makes the mouth visible through the plastic, through the mask. Five, a mandatory task, tax of 20% or more on all to-go orders that would replace tips that wait staff rely on to get by. Six, I know that there are several medical workers in our community who spent time in New York City hospitals last spring and summer helping overworked healthcare staff. Perhaps we could arrange for some of them to meet and discuss what they went through on the front lines with this group of business owners in hopes of reaching them on a personal level. I've dedicated most of my life to becoming an expert in the scientific field, and I'm deeply frustrated by people who think that they can run searches on the internet, read articles that confirm their biases, and feel satisfied that they know 
better than the bulk of scientists and healthcare workers. We need strong leadership on this issue and creative problem solving now more than ever. Was that, did you complete it? Oh, that was the end of her email. Okay. Uh, Don, bef Don, before you go on, I for counsel, just in case you don't know, and for clarification to the public, um, in the lawsuit that was mentioned in that public comment, just for clarification to everybody, the city was not named in that. I just want that to be clear to all council members. We are not involved in that, and we are not spending any money on it. Thank you. Okay. The next is from Becca Warner. A deep sense of shock has come with this new wave of COVID-19 cases locally. Our community is not immune to the impacts of the virus because we are rural, though people appear to act as such. I am feeling as though it is imperative that we continue to have the conversation around community accountability, which is why I'm writing to you. There are restaurants and businesses that refuse to enforce the mask mandate while not adhering to it themselves. I understand that a restaurant coalition has formed and is taking legal action against members of environmental health. I understand that the Board of Supervisors voted against hefty fines for businesses not in compliance. I understand this is sticky and I do not envy you for your responsibility to the people. I have some questions for you. I understand there, there is a portal where community members can report businesses not in compliance. What actions are taken after a report is submitted? What are the repercussions for such businesses? What is the responsibility of environmental health and or other governing bodies to shut down a business if they are adamant about refusing to adhere? I realize that there are just some businesses that even with their permits revoked, they continue to operate. What happens next? As the market manager of the Nevada City Farmers Market, I have questions pertaining to our permit for Union Street and Robinson Plaza. If we are permitted for that space, how do we enforce our slash the mass policy? Under our permit, do we have the right to ask individuals to leave and will our local police department support us in that? What do you have to offer in terms of enforcement of the mask mandate while in the public space? I am to understand that the mask mandate requires individuals to wear a mask outdoors when they cannot physically distance from other people. It can be challenging in the market space to do so. Therefore, it is in line with the mandate that we require masks. We are meeting heavy opposition, so any guidance and leadership you can offer to support the market and keeping our community safe is held in deepest gratitude. This new COVID spike is deeply frightening as it is a clear indication of our community's COVID fatigue. Some of these cases stem from Halloween gatherings. Okay. The next is from Jess Tabor. I sat on the webinar, webinar meeting and they told me to reach out to five members of my community. I'm reaching out to you five as I am a downtown Nevada City resident and I feel this issue is beyond pivotal at this point. Last week, I saw a picture circulating the internet of servers at Friar Tucks not wearing a single mask. Every single person serving, busing, and running plates to tables where they came within two feet of customers were maskless. It seems utterly sad that people at this stage aren't protecting the public they serve. I decided to walk by myself after I saw the photograph and indeed the workers aren't following protocol at this particular restaurant and many others. So now what is the advice of the council with cases like these? Are you and environmental health actually going to penalize these business businesses? Who and how do we report such businesses? In the age of a purple wave of a COVID where we saw 20% of the county's overall COVID cases in the last week, isn't it only a given that all restaurants and stores must follow the mandates otherwise face the consequences? I have heard from many of the tireless owners of businesses here who are taking this serious and have done everything the state and county have asked and more. They are very frustrated. There don't seem to be a real consequences to the violators. I believe it's a slap in the face to all those people and the general public for that matter. In addition to those perpetrators, I serve on the board for the Nevada City Farmers Market. There is a coalition being formed by certain don't tread on me folks who are trying to disturb our market by passing out anti-mask flyers, newspapers, and journals. They refuse to wear masks and are suggesting that to all who come to the market as they can. We called the police twice last week as they were trespassing upon the rented space we use with no masks as mandated by the state in order to stay open to the public. Distributing their newspaper and soliciting the public to hear the conspiracy of masks. OK, 
Okay, the next is from John Tabor. I work in Nevada City part of the time at KVMR and I frequent the shops and restaurants and I and find it astonishing that people are still not respecting the mask and social distance mandates. I also find it unresponsive that the county does not have enforcement for the mandates that are set down by local and state authorities. As a local producer for two large events, I know that we are most likely not having California World Fest or KVMR Celtic Fest in, two, in 2021. This will also affect the other events like County Fair and the holiday street markets in both Nevada City and Grass Valley. All live shows at Miners Foundry and the Center for the Arts, it goes on and on. Think where we would be now if everyone had approached masks in March as they do seatbelt usage. Please take this into consideration as you look to make your plans for the city and county moving forward. Okay, the next is from Cynthia Stewart. I am so concerned about the uptick in positive COVID results in the last two weeks, and I am equally as concerned about what's coming if the county doesn't start enforcing the governor's mandate of no indoor dining. It is your responsibility, is it, is it your responsibility to enforce this? Okay, sorry. It is your responsibility to enforce this, is it not? What can we do to keep our community safe? How can you not enforce this mandate when it is so, it so clearly will save lives? The next is from Carrie Hawthorne and Kira Wesley. We write this as concerned small business owners and lifelong residents of Nevada City. It is deeply concerning that the city has not come forward with a strong mass policy and enforcement practices during this pandemic. The county numbers are reflecting our own weak and disorganized approach. Please lead this city with strong, clear, and preventative safety policies to protect the locals, visitors, businesses, and in turn the city's own economical stability. In addition, we should look at Grass Valley as, real, as really an excellent example of how a city can organize with its businesses and build a visually appealing outdoor area to keep the money flowing. The next is from Nakia Schwartz. <clears throat> I'm writing as a citizen, a parent, and an employee of several downtown businesses to re request city council support, a cohesive plan for the city of Nevada City around COVID-19 restrictions. I'm not sure what measures can be taken or what power we or city council has to execute safety practices but it's clear we are feeling the detrimental impacts of our lack of vision and leadership around this. Not only are businesses closed and on the brink of closing, the fabric of our community is being destroyed as individuals and business owners are forced to fight this, all, this out amongst themselves. I've had to make several trips to the Bay Area during the pandemic and each time have been astonished at the ease of which those much bigger and more diverse communities seem to be handling this. I felt safer and businesses seem to be thriving and adapting. There is a culture of mutual respect. Certainly this is an attainable goal for a town this size that can be met with strong leadership. I don't like wearing a mask. I don't like anyone telling me what to do, but if we persist in a lack of direction and mandates regarding the, research, the recent surge in COVID-19 infections, we are facing much more dire consequences as a community than a mild infringement on our individual comforts. <clears throat> The next comes from Maxine Ponovic. Please use it wisely and realize, oh, to all of you in a position of power, please use it wisely and realize that allowing people and businesses to live and work without constraints is actually the best approach in a community like ours, which has not experienced a pandemic. The division you will create by closing down businesses and further enforcing face masks will do more damage than good. People need to breathe and live more now than ever. Mental health is suffering and morale is low. Choose to be on the right side of history and do nothing more in the way of rules and laws. We have too many of them already. Be kind, our leaders, and let us in Nevada County live as adults and do not further exasperate the fear. This is true leadership. The next is from Shannon Manuel. I'm writing to express my concerns for your meeting this evening. These lockdowns have been proven to be more detrimental to all communities around the world and cause more suffering than the virus, which has a 99.97% recovery rate. One of my dear friends, 50 plus years old, and they religiously wore a mask, 
and her boyfriend got COVID tested positive, had a mild cold. They were sent home with zero directions from any official. No check-in, no recommendations once the, they inflated these fear-mongering statistics with their cases. 10 days later, one of them got on a plane and flew home. Zero problem, because the reality is this is not about the virus. Another friend got bacterial pneumonia from wearing a mask and almost died. They are linking mask wearing effects after prolonged use, being similar to being intoxicated while driving. Statistic after statistic has shown that the masks don't work. They actually inflame the illness and are causing irreparable mental, emotional, and physical harm to our children. The lockdowns destroy lives, like the two teens that committed suicide just last week. One is in a coma and most likely now brain dead. Also, the massive alcoholism, drug overdoses, and loss of livelihood for so many in our community. Your stances have been destructive beyond measure. So I want to ask each of you, what happened here? When did you lose your consciousness and decide to play God with human lives? Because that is what you are doing. Lockdowns, businesses, schools, churches, closing, plus being held to insane standards and financial repercussions have devastatingly, tragically, and illegally, unconstitutionally destroyed people's lives. There's still time to work from, from integrity, your inner guidance, and uphold your humanity before you are held accountable for these horrors inflicted on your community. None of this is worth the lives lost and irreparable damage to our community that have been created by these measures and not by COVID. <clears throat> Truth matters, and it's time you acknowledge Okay, the next is from Sarah O. One size will never fit all and we can all read and see the science that says masks do not work. Give people choice. If people are sick, they should stay home and people are. Masks protect the wearer as you can read in peer reviewed literature below. People have real medical and mental health reasons for not wearing masks and you are discriminating against those people. We are all adults that can make educated decisions based on our health conditions and needs. We do not need you to be our parents and continue this overreach of government into our lives. Please stop. You have no constitutional right and you have no medical license. This is only further straining small businesses and the connection of our community. Please see meaningful peer reviewed science and articles to support mass choice, not mandates and social community pressure. Okay, the next is from Annie McCann. We all know that during the holidays, there are more suicides, more drug and alcohol overdoses, and more people suffering from isolation, depression, and desperation. Please consider this when adding more weight to an already heavy situation. Our county has a much lower COVID count than many other counties throughout California. With this in mind, I ask you to look at the bigger picture and take all these things into perspective, including the oncoming local economic depression when making decisions regarding more mandates for our county. This next one is from Renette Senum. Let it be known laws are not based upon science and data, but a legislative process. On November 14th, Sutter County Superior Court Judge Sarah Heckman's ruling placed a permanent injunction against the governor that prevents him from changing existing state law, even during the <coughs> pandemic. The court rejected Governor Newsom's extraordinary claim that a state of emergency turns California into an autocracy and centralizes the state's powers in the hands of the governor. This is the unlawful basis on which Newsom has collapsed California's system of checks and balances, issuing 57 executive orders and changing over 400 laws unilaterally. As a city official, you have no legal authority to uphold an illegal and unconstitutional order. The city is currently embroiled in a class action lawsuit with local restaurant owners. The city cannot afford another legal battle, so please don't further entangle the city in this matter. The city cannot financially afford this. In addition, regarding to the COVID data, Kerry Mulis himself, the inventor of the PCR test, said before his death in 2019 that the PCR test was intended to be used as a manufacturing technique being able to replicate DNA sequences millions and billions of times and not as a diagnostic tool to detect viruses. Please do the right thing and do not utilize unscientifically based data to enforce an unconstitutional and illegal executive order.
The next is from Deanna Figuera. I am writing to appeal to lessen restrictions rather than increase them. There is plenty of data to support that the results of a lockdown and mask wearing are damaging to people's mental health, physical health, and financial well-being, and no actual proof that it has any has had any positive effect. Please try to stand up to the pressure that you are receiving to conform and do the right thing. Think about what children are being taught that this is the way of life, that they should distance from friends and others they know, that they should live in fear, that not being able to see people's faces is normal. My heart breaks for the children more than anyone else. I am the grandmother of five and it makes no sense to see my three-year-old grandson in a mask so that he can go to preschool and play with other children at a distance of six feet. Those that fear should stay inside and wear masks. Let the rest of us live. Sorry, Katrina's giving me a few more, so. Okay, sorry about that delay. Um, okay. So the next one is um, a little confusing, but I think I can figure it out. Okay, so it comes from Lena Martignago. Please watch this video. Obviously, I can't show that to you. And do not implement more mandates which will divide our county and turn people against each other. There are more than enough information on web that PCR tests are not accurate. 90% of them produce false positive results. Please do not burden your soul by destroying our lives. The creator of test himself said that you cannot use PCR tests to establish an infection process. The masks do not protect us from the virus. The halls between mask fibers too big to catch the virus. On a contrary, people developing hard health conditions by wearing masks for too long. Our governor himself does not wear masks. Please do not research Please do your research before you will make a decision which can affect hundreds of people negatively. Please use your power wisely. You are our leaders. We put our lives in your hands. Please remember this. And then Sergio Martignago, um, I think just reiterated what she said. He, he attached the same thing. Okay, the next is from Willie Bailey. Please do not make our little town into ghost town. With a virus that has such a high rate of recovery, why are we putting our small businesses out of business? Obviously our own governor doesn't follow his own mandates. Please choose wisely. This is from Rick Barron. I strongly object to any further restrictions. It's put, in major, hard, it's put major hardships on our resident business owners. It's completely unjustified. Why aren't you looking at the numbers um, big, these aren't complete sentences. Big pharmacy murders, starving children. We've had more people commit suicide in our county in the last eight months than have died from COVID. Wake up, don't destroy your children's future. I want to, yes, okay. And then Cheyenne um, Sheaf. I am absolutely opposed to all the pandemic mandates in place. Masks are proven by medical doctors worldwide to do more harm than good. The stay-at-home orders and closing of small business is detrimental to the fabric of our society and it is unconstitutional. Okay. This one's from Re Rebecca Franks. As you prepare for tonight's meeting, I ask you to remember that without our lovely businesses, we lose a substantial part of our community. We are not a high-risk community and do a pretty darn good job managing ourselves. Further restrictions will do additional and possibly irreparable damage to our small business owners. 
We are strong, resilient, and continue to adjust and manage. Message is received from Daniela Fernandez. Please allow these small family-owned businesses and restaurant to survive. We need to support rather than further hamper their ability to remain viable. Please be thoughtful that without these integral parts of our community, we will have shuttered doors and lose neighbors, family and friends from our county. Let's give them a chance to survive. It's possible and we can do it together. This lockdown has caused such isolation, mental health issues, financial devastation. Let's help those suffering to recover. Please do no further harm. We need to find a way to come together and find ways to move forward safely and intelligently. I don't want our beautiful town empty and broken. The next is from Kayla Pearson. I have been a Nevada County resident, specifically the Grass Valley, Nevada City areas. I know there is a town council meeting at 630 tonight and I have some mentionables to bring to the table in regard to that meeting. Here are a few things I would like to see in Nevada County in reference to COVID-19. More, more consistent signage reminding people to wear masks properly over the mouth and the nose. Consistent floor stickers demonstrating to people how to keep their distance. Hand sanitizers at doorways of all businesses. City personnel wearing masks, specifically police officers, whom I have seen without masks several times. A mandatory tax on to-go food to help wait staff who are making tips. Mandatory informational sessions for anti-mask users, um, anti-mask business owners with healthcare workers in our community who worked in NYC this year. Other equally important topics. Why is the coalition that is suing the city and state only wants restaurants who don't have to deal with the mandate? How can we as members of the community support environmental health and help in other ways? Who can we call if we see blatant violations in our county? Thank you for taking the time to read and move these items to the table. The next is from Tracy Sterling. I'm writing to share my sincere wish that no more mandates are implemented. I am very concerned about the detriment to the economic health, mental health, and well being of our entire community in an attempt to protect us more from a virus that currently has a total death rate of 0.017%, according to worldmeters.info, which you can easily compute yourself by using the current total world death total, death count, and the total coronavirus death count. I'm sure you have the current percentage for Nevada County, which is incredibly low as well. I am considered a high risk individual as I have a chronic lung disorder and I in no way want others to feel they have to alter their livelihood, their social interactions or their well being to protect me. I am an adult and I am aware of the risks and my preference would be to live my life as I always have for the sake of my well being, which greatly affects my health and immune system. And my preference would be that others are allowed to do what what each feels best for him or herself. We need the choice for social interaction, the ability to breathe freely, and the ability to run our businesses freely for the sake of our health and well being of our community. Okay, the next is Monica Farbiars. Please consider the real outcome of putting more constraints on business and people. Measurements that instead of helping to build a healthy and thriving society is making people to contract and to live in fear of others and to create gaps, not only affecting the economy, but the very fundamental core of our sanity. Instead of mandatory measures, bring measurement to help to create resilient communities through programs that build immune systems creating conversations that help people to take care of themselves and others. Please use common sense around wearing the mask inside or in outdoor activities. It is important that we are allowed to breathe. It actually is the very principle for a good immune system. Okay, this is from Andrea Logicano. Imagine, let's imagine for a moment that people are adults and know how to take care of themselves. I know it is hard to believe today that an individual still have rights and with some intelligence could do well for himself without the beloved government micromanaging every single move he wants to do. Even our amazing governor goes to parties without a mask, knowing that the danger is minimal. Let's not believe easily that what he says in public has any real meaning. I hope you still have some integrity and the idea of ruining more people's lives is not just posturing for political reason as Mr. Newsom. 
hoping for the best for all of us. No more mandates, please. This is from Penelope Williams. I ask you not to implement any more mandates or rules of any sort regarding masks and shutdown. I am a senior citizen and appreciate being able to live like an adult in our area. The masks are dangerous to our health and even more so in the damp of winter. Do the right thing and keep all businesses open and stop policing of masks. Uh, Lauren Perez Loy Loiza. Businesses are dying, children are committing suicide, social distancing brings us mental, emotional, and physical sickness. Masks deprive us of the oxygen our bodies need. Please stop supporting killing our businesses, killing children, destroying people's livelihoods, and torturing us with isolation and fear. There is no state of emergency here and never has been. We can make educated decisions about how to protect our health. We don't need your tyrannical guidelines, orders, and mandates to protect us. Stand up for the vitality of our community. Okay, this one is from Penelope Sullivan. I'm deeply concerned on our response to COVID. The creator of the PCR test has repeatedly stated in the past that this testing format is not to be used as a diagnostic test. Going further, the county has pushed flu vaccines to children as well as adults which directly inject viral particles into the body as required masks for children to go to school, as well as for entry into most establishments. The warmth and moisture created from breathing has been scientifically documented as harboring bacteria and lab tests masks confirm this with findings of multiple bacterial strains in masks. It is very likely that we are getting false positives from this actions. A boy from sale just killed himself. This is the second attempt in that class alone. Stop this nonsense. Okay, this comes from Cameron. Will you all be personally liable if people pass out and hit their head or from adverse effects of prolonged mask wearing can have on employees and citizens? Here is an excerpt from a peer review study on masks in healthcare workers. Remember, there is little to no studies on masks used in the general population. As the purpose of wearing the face masks is to protect the wearers by filtering out viruses and bacteria, it is obviously questionable whether the surgical mask, which induce less heat, stress, and discomfort, can provide enough protection for healthcare workers. Therefore, it got that one got cut off. So uh, the next one is from Sarah. According to the only randomized controlled trial of cloth face masks in the entire peer reviewed medical literature, penetration of cloth masks by particles was almost 97%. In other words, cloth masks only block 3% of particles. Furthermore, the study results cautions against the use of cloth masks, stating moisture retention, reuse of cloth masks, and poor filtration may result in increased risk of infection. This is from Cecilia. Um, original research, November 18th, 2020, effectiveness of adding a mask recommendation to other public health measures to prevent SARS infection in Danish mask wearers. A, a randomized controlled trial, the difference in rates in infection. This isn't really making sense to me, but I'm just curious, between the control groups, no masks and medical mask wearers was 2.1% versus 1.8% respectively. Odds ratio was 0.4 to 1.23. No significant difference. This is from Pamela. I was concerned that when all was said and done about the commercial street, oh, this one's on commercial street. And we have that, so I'm gonna hold on to that one. Okay, this one is from Alex. Please refrain from adding any further restrictions or measures governing how business manages COVID safety. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine has found that even strict compliance to masking, hand washing, and social distancing does not stop the spread of the virus. Let our businesses and residents make their own health decisions as these measures will not stop the spread and our county has only four hospitalized patients currently.
Yeah. Okay, this one is also from Alex, but I don't know if it's the same Alex. <laughs> Please support our small businesses and refrain. Um, Refrain. John, are they from Nevada City residents, or are they saying where they're from? Um, this one is Grass Valley, but I can didn't we, look at that as we were going through it. Okay. Can we assume that if I'm sorry, just for clarity, can we assume that if you didn't mention it, they didn't state? Is that correct, or no? No, I was only reading the names. Got it. Can you let us know where they're from, where they live, please? Yeah, that was the last one. So. Um, Maybe you guys want to move on and I'll tally that up. Thanks so much. Yeah, that yep. would be great. Okay. Thank you um, for that. Okay. Now we're going to move on to council member request items, committee reports, and future agenda items. And tonight I'm going to start with Doug. Hi. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so given, you know, all the comments we're having on COVID, and mask compliance, uh, both for and against. Um, I think it behooves us to, to discuss this, you know, seriously as a council. Um, and since we don't have a lot of time, I mean, since we do have a lot of time between this meeting and our next meeting, I'd like to suggest that we have a special meeting to sort of go over what the council's guidance is, because I don't think we've given any policy direction to staff yet, um, except for agreeing that we were going to enforce the governor's mandate as it was at the time we voted. Um, things have changed, the mandates change. Uh, there's a lot of concern about us going up a level, um, or, or two levels rather, to the purple tier. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, I think that the public needs to be educated a little better on, on some of this stuff, not the science behind the mask. I think that, you know, that's for another time. But I think that we can come up with some guidance for staff and some policies for our merchants that are consistent, understandable. Uh, I think there needs to be, you know, an education component that needs to be proactive instead of reactive. Um, and so I, I really think we need an opportunity to discuss this. It's not on the agenda today and, and we can't really discuss it. So I'm hoping that we can schedule a special meeting next week um, at everybody's convenience to address this on a more in-depth basis. So that's really my, um, my requested item. So thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, hey, can we do the Mayor, if you're if you're going to discuss this, I would I would not suggest next week as that is Thanksgiving week. And sorry, Doug, I, I'm going to step in and say I, I had planned on taking that week off. And I know there's several other staff members that are not going to be here. And so um, and it, it's also a short week. So if you are going to have the discussion about a special meet, uh, meeting, I would suggest that it's it's around or outside of next week. I don't, I don't think that that's soon enough. Um, 175 of our 198 active cases are within the last week. I think that we've sat on this for too long and I think that it needs direction now. Um, so I would recommend that we meet this week. Uh, I, that's not easy for me to meet tomorrow or Friday, um, but I think it's important and I think it needs to be addressed. We also have to have a 24 hour noticing period. Friday so it, would have, it would have to be Friday. Is okay, there, so can I um, get a motion for a special meeting? I'll make a motion that we have a special meeting uh, on Friday if everybody can make it to discuss uh, our response to the increase in COVID cases and our rising to the purple tier. I second that. Okay. okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Roll call, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to go back. Is there any other discussion on this? Well, each of us still haven't spoken, Aaron, so maybe you should just go through all of us as planned, and then we can decide on this. You know what? Good idea. I'm sorry. You're Dwayne. Well said. So um, let's just thank you, Doug, and let's move on. 
and um, to everybody, and then we'll come right back to this, okay? Mayor, can I remind you to you, you have the authority under your procedures to call a special meeting. So if you want a motion, you can have one, but it's not necessary. Since oh, okay. you have the input, you can just schedule it. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move on for your comments and I'll do it at the end of this. Um, Dwayne, how about you go next? Well, I'll, I'll agree right off the bat with Doug and everybody else that we'll go ahead and move forward with this in whatever form that takes and the sooner the better. Um, I, I would say even though tonight the, the letters are somewhat even as Don's uh, you know, been reading, my input is absolutely 95% local input that people want more restrictions and are, are petrified about what's happening right now. So first of all, I'll go along with that. Uh, secondly, we've had uh, ERC uh, strategic planning meeting last week where they're looking forward to all of next year. Um, a lot of good information. I'll bring that forward as it progresses. Um, let's see here. Uh, Lisa will be stepping down and uh, Jason Foy will be stepping back in as their lead. So we'll be dealing with him and I'll be dealing with him uh, for you guys. Uh, we had transit commission meeting this morning. Um, nothing big, they're moving forward with the rebranding. Then we had transportation commission meeting this morning. Um, Dan Landon is, is officially, uh, as we already know, resigning, but Mike Woodman did accept the position. He was Dan's assistant. So he'll be stepping in on transit for us. Um, and I'll be hopefully bringing Danielle in. She's shown interest in uh, more, uh, being more active, even though she's uh, the, you know, the second or the backup. I, I don't see that happening. I think she'll be a co, um, you know, co-lead with me on that moving forward. And they, they know her already and, and she understands what they're doing. Um, obviously, you guys, we, I didn't get in until late. I couldn't get through. I had to email a bunch of people on the cash and field phone call today, um, but I was in on the last part of that. So I'll, I'll let you guys report, but I got the gist of what's going on. Um, and then waste management, we had a, a large um, group of complaints over the last three weeks of people being missed. I was one of them. We got missed three weeks in a row, uh, specifically on recycle, uh, tried to deal with Shivati directly. And then he, I think a week ago, you guys all probably saw, we had an email from her stating that they had uh, some issues with uh, trucks being broken down and employees, this and that. Um, so we'll have to discuss that, but I'll bring that forward too uh, as we move forward on the solid waste and hazard waste commission committee that um, I'm not on now. Um, but it, she tried to do her best, but it was very frustrating. We still haven't heard back. A lot of people still haven't uh, had their routes picked up and yet there still has not even been an offer of a refund for services not rendered for two plus weeks going on. So uh, we'll all talk to staff about that. And uh, that's all I have. Great, thanks Dwayne. Daniela? Yeah, I'm not gonna say too much more about the COVID. I support the special meeting. Um, I would like to recommend that it is after hours um, so that people can attend because I think it's important for the community um, to understand and uh, be a part of the conversation. And I also uh, wanted to make um, an announcement for uh, Shelly Covert and the Nevada City uh, Rancheria Tribe. Um, this is Nissan on Heritage Month. They usually have Nissan on Heritage Day the first Saturday of November every year. And of course, uh, because we are in COVID times, they weren't able to do that in person. So we're asking you to join uh, the Nevada City Rancheria Nissan on Tribe and the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project, otherwise known as CHIRP, as they celebrate the month of November, Nisanan Heritage Month. Check out the updated website at nisanan.org, that's N-I-S-E-N-A-N.org, and contribute through their important GoFundMe campaign. They have a goal of $30,000. Um, and as you may know, um, the Nevada City Council uh, unanimously adopted a resolution to support the tribe's effort of federal recognition. And um, we agreed to open every council meeting with that land acknowledgement. I'm sure you heard it today. 
And you can support the tribe further by implementing a land acknowledgement to open your meetings and events. And if you would like more information about that or language, please reach out to me or Aaron or Shelly directly. Um, we'd be happy to assist you with that. But please make sure you check out nisanon.org this month. There's a lot of really cool information. They've put up videos, educational things to learn more about the tribe, more about who they are, the history of them, the history of this land that predates the gold rush, uh, which I think is also a really important history. Daniela, thank you. You did that so much better than I was going to do, and I'm so glad you did that. So Sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I have a number of announcements. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the Measure M Committee, who worked so amazingly hard on getting the message out on Measure M, and it passed, and it passed at 88% approval. So it was a job well done. And I want to thank Nancy Bill, Valerie Mulberg, Brian McAllister, Bill Falcone, Rick Ewald, Neil Locke, Mike Barber, Gretchen Vaughn, and Jesse Locke, and Katrina Olson for all the work you did. And um, this is such a great thing for the city. And so thank you. And I am thrilled that it passed. Thank you all. So also, um, just give me a second here. Um, tonight, um, I also would like to move something on the agenda. Um, the new business, I would like it to move it up be to... Um, before the consent items, and that's uh, new business A and B, because I have a whole bunch of people here for it, and I don't want to have them have them sit through the entire meeting. Chrissy, do I need to do get it okay on that, or can I just do that? No, you actually can uh, move things on the agenda. I sent you a message um, in the chat clarifying that you do need a majority of the council members to approve a special meeting, or you can ask Katrina to set that. Um, sorry, I misstated the procedure. I had to look up the specifics on that. Okay, great. Thank you. You are okay. able to make. So right after this, um, I am going to do new business A and B, just so everybody knows that. Um, so yes, I um, would like to call a special meeting for Friday. Um, Katrina. Uh, Mayor, may I suggest that we do it at first thing in the morning? Um, uh, again, there's, I, I, I would like the, the police chief to be there. I mean, there are a couple of the staff members and I know, I, I hate to go back to it again, but uh, some people are starting their vacation on that Friday. And so I think a, a, an early morning meeting um, makes sense so that I know that the staff that I think that are important be involved and hearing that message uh, about where we're going um, and have the opportunity to, you know, discuss any potential, um, you know, things that we see from uh, the operational perspective so that you also have that information as well. And um, that would just be a suggestion. Okay. And our 8 a.m. meetings seem to work for the, the people that um, have uh, jobs to go to on um, those days. Okay. Um... Daniela, you asked for it to be late in the evening. I am concerned that we are doing this on a Friday. Um, we have heard from a lot of the public about their concerns. I mean, I've heard from a lot of um, people that live in Nevada City that are very concerned about people not wearing masks. And we have just heard from a whole bunch of people that don't want us to enforce anything. But I think that as a council, we need to have this discussion and they're give clear guidelines to our staff and on where we're going with this. So I'd like it to work for everybody. Um, and people can write in uh, from this point to Friday morning and we'll be able to hear them because they aren't attending the meeting. So I would like to call that meeting for 8 a.m. on Friday. And Aaron, Aaron, just to pitch into the chamber a few years ago, I remember we, we had a similar situation 
And when they pulled the merchants downtown, most of our merchants, and I actually agree with Daniel, I'd prefer to do it after hours, but uh, most of our merchants downtown open at 10 a.m. or later, the vast majority do. And most of our citizens at that point that responded start regular day jobs at 9 a.m. So if we're going to do it at 8, let's just start like we do tonight and allow the public comment to be the very first thing for people to go to work at 8 if we can't do it after hours. Okay. Um, so that, that's the best option, I think, separate from doing after hours. Okay. I mean, I agree. I, it's hard to make it work for everybody. And um, Danielle, are you okay with that? Um, I'm not excited about it, uh, but I will defer to the to the majority here. I start work at 8.30 in the morning, and most people I know start work at 8.30 in the morning and end at 5. And so I think part of what we do um, is, is uh, we meet in front of the public and for the public and for the benefit of the public. So if we do it at a time where the public cannot be present or the public have to watch it later, I think that's an issue. I hear it's complicated. It's Friday, it's a holiday, it's before a holiday. It is so complicated and we're in COVID times and this is an emergency. And I believe that uh, it requires it requires different different measures than we usually would. So I will defer to the group, but um, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly fond of the choice. Okay, well, um, just so you know, I'm supposed to work at 7 a.m. that morning, so I'm going to have to rearrange. But, um, Doug, any comment on that, please? No, I, I you know, I, I understand the, the difficulty here. I, I have to agree with Daniela that we want the public to be involved, but I think the more important aspect is that staff is, is involved, too, as Katrina directs because you know she had the good point that they're going to be involved in, in uh, you know, enforcing this mandate as well especially chad or, or chief ellis and and so i i think we we have to do it at eight o'clock I, I think that's pretty quick for us doing a meeting i mean i think that's the, the quickest we've ever done it and this is yeah. you know being looked at as an emergency so uh, I, i'm fine with eight o'clock if that's all we can come up with and it makes it easier for everybody okay so I'm calling a meeting, a special meeting for Friday, um, November 20th at 8 a.m. Second. And Aaron, did you see Chrissy's message? Which, okay. No. I don't think you need a motion. You've just had a majority input, so you're fine. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going to move on. Uh, Unless Aaron, anybody before you move on, do you want those numbers? Yes, yeah, please, Don. Thank you. Um, so it looks like there is 34 emails total. Um, six of them were Nevada City residents. Four were Nevada City businesses. Um, two said Nevada City. So that doesn't clarify whether they're county or residents. One Nevada City County, one Grass Valley, and 20 unknown. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks, Don. So Chrissy for, Chrissy, for a point of clarification for the minutes, I'm sorry. Um, so do I just, do I put that the mayor called the meeting, a special meeting at eight o'clock on Friday or that I'm calling it, or does she, is, is there a vote that I'm supposed to put down? You can just put a majority of council members okay. called the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, now this is, I'm so excited about this next piece. Um, under new business, we are, um, is Sam Goodspeed here? Yes. Okay. So under new business, um, the subject is the Nevada City Fire Advisory Committee update. And um, I'm gonna let Sam introduce this piece. Okay. Um... So uh, at our last strategic planning meeting, uh, we were given direction to uh, go ahead and uh, form a fire advisory committee uh, with uh, council member Manette being the lead. Um, we uh, formed that with uh, six members from the public for a total of uh, eight on the board. Um, we've had, uh, seven meetings, I believe 
beginning um, in uh, Ju July. I don't have my, my notes up. I, I wasn't ready for you to jump ahead just yet. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been uh, a, a great group. Um, I have to say, um, as far as uh, public committees are concerned, um, the, this group is uh, very active. Um, they've got uh, a lot of good ideas. We're working hand in hand with uh, the local Firewise communities. Uh, that are giving a lot of input and support to the uh, implementation of some of the programs that are being developed. Um, <clears throat> most recently, we came to the council uh, seeking uh, permission to, to move forward with a grant application. Uh, permission was granted. We moved forward with that. We made it uh, under the deadline. I think we had a really good product. Uh, the Sierra Fund with uh, Great input and support with uh, from Carrie, um, really really nailed the uh, application. So I think we have a good shot there. Um, after this, I think uh, we're going to talk about how we're going to uh, present the GoFundMe program and uh, try to ra raise the fifty percent match. But um, I think there's some others that uh, would like to chime in here and, and talk about some specific projects, and I'll, I'll let them go ahead. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm just gonna, yes, we've actually come up with some programs and I'm just gonna introduce um, Richard Thomas, who um, spearhead, I'm sorry, you know what, Terry, you're supposed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, Terry, I'm gonna introduce you to move on with this. All right, okay. So I am um, Terry Voorhees of 334 Jordan Street. And um, I am one of the members of this newly formed Nevada City Fire Safety Advisory Committee. And um, as Sam was mentioning that um, this was formed out of um, when three of our Firewise communities came to the council. Um, and that was back in February and the city leaders at that time established the committee um, I'm going to read real quick our mission statement. It's read at the beginning of each of our meetings. It's to promote public fire safety and community involvement to protect Nevada City residents, business owners, visitors, and structures from wildfire. We are establishing objectives to support overall vegetation management and wildfire mitigation, identifying funding sources, and promoting public education and awareness. Um, and so we really want to thank the city leaders for backing this and um, our Firewise communities have been so excited to partner with the city and we have the extra added bonus of having the Sierra Fund help us out too. So it's a really, really strong committee. Um, we do have Mayor Minette chairing it. We've got Sam Goodspeed um, attending every meeting and giving all of his great input. Um, Terry Anderson represents our Willow Valley Firewise community. Annette Seabury is with the Greater Cement Hill Firewise community. Sam Gitchell is representing our Greater Champion Firewise community and is also our vice chair. And Richard Thomas and myself represent Deer Creek Southside. Um, and these are all Firewise communities that have, um, that are very, very active. Pardon me. I have got it just okay. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. And also we have Dr. Carrie Monahan with the Sierra Fund. Um, we owe a big thank you to Pete Williams. He is on the board of the Fire Safe Council and he facilitated all the early meetings and helped the committee articulate our goals and our structure of how we're gonna work together. So we did start just in April and we have met um, at least monthly, if not more. Uh, we have um, opted, most of the meetings have been through Zoom to keep us all COVID safe and follow that protocol. Um, and some of our current projects that we're working on this year are identifying and mapping city owned properties and the status of the treatment of properties, updating the Nevada city website as it pertains to fire preparedness, um, we are always on the lookout for grant opportunities. Um, and then looking into the wooden street sign replacement uh, using more fire safe materials. Um, we did have just this past weekend, um, we hosted our first volunteer 
light work day for fire safety over at the Spring Street property. And so I'd like to introduce Richard Thomas from Deer Creek Southside, and he's gonna give a quick recap on what that looked like. Richard, unmute. <laughs> Thank you, Doug and others. Um, Richard, um, before you start, I'd just like to say that we have pictures that Katrina can put up if you would like. Sure. Okay. It'll be more fun than looking at me. <laughs> so um, so there's uh, city properties. I think they've identified 20 or more um, small pieces of city property that are basically unmaintained. They're too small basically to sell for a lot. Uh, uh, and the, but the city owns them and it's the city uh, is feeling like we need to take better care of them. So the project was on the upper end of Drummond Street where Drummond would go on through. But right now there's a trail that comes down from co-housing and pops out on the very top of Spring Street. Well, the grants that, uh, that have been applied, that, that you folks applied for, would take care of a good portion of that. But the small section at the top we decided to take on with volunteers and last Saturday we mustered about 20 volunteers. I think I think it was actually 20 volunteers uh, that showed up and in a matter of uh, two hours or so did an amazing job on that property. And then Bubba and the city folks came and, and cleared out the piles and did the chipping. And it's a huge improvement. Um, uh, Chris, Chris Miller from co-housing has done some maintenance on that trail over time. And he was there and he's committed to continuing to do more. The plan is once these slivers, these small pieces get cleaned up to find neighbors, other people in the city to adopt them and maintain them in a fire resilient uh, manner. So the other slivers that are in the grant proposal, and maybe I should leave this to carry, but the, the, the larger piece at the top of Drummond and a piece at the bottom of Drummond where it runs into Ooh, old Downeyville Highway or that little Bennett extension, wherever they join down there. I'm not sure what that is, above Wyoming. And then over on Jordan Street, there's a Y where Jordan and Gethsemane Street come together, where Zion Street comes down. Uh, and there's a piece there. So that's one of the four included in the grant proposal. And the last one is the other end of Jordan Street. If Jordan were to continue on down to South Pine, just by the bridge, that is city property. There's a little wooden stairway in there. We call it Jacob's Ladder. Uh, and then it goes on up to the corner of Gethsemane and South Pine. So volunteers have already been working on that easier section of that, but having a crew come in and do the initial work on those four parcels would then make them much more um, uh, doable for neighbor uh, volunteers and people to step up and adopt them. And I think that's my report. Thanks, Richard. And uh, on your screen, it's a picture of the volunteers that showed up and, um, I think we have some others of just the work being done. I, I, I did hear it say that, that somehow I headed this up. I didn't, Sam Gitchell headed this up. It's actually on the very edge of the Champion Mind Fire uh, Wise community. Uh, he headed it up and he, uh, he continued to encourage my participation. So uh, the two of us got her, got her done along with 17 other volunteers. Great. Um, your mayor, our mayor. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, we had a two huge piles going and it was great. That's great. And so um, thank you, Richard, for that and, and describing that was, again, the, our very first uh, volunteer work day and we'd like to see more of those happen. Um, and then next, what we'd like to do is um, we do have Dr. Carrie Monahan who would like to um, go into more depth and uh, describe uh, what is known as our city slivers, adopt a sliver program. And um, Dr. Monahan is program director at the Sierra Fund, as well as um, a faculty in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at CSU Chico. And she's been a huge asset to the committee and has already submitted two grant proposals on behalf of the city. Thanks so much. Uh, Katrina, could you stop sharing and then maybe you'll have to make me a, a host in order to share by going down to participants. Okay, and hovering over my name and I will share. It's a very short presentation. I think it's a total of five or six slides, but we did wanna put some of this into context. 
All right, here I have some ability to share now. Great, so thanks so much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Carrie Monahan. I'm the program director for the Sierra Fund. And it's been my pleasure to serve as a member of the Nevada City Fire Safety Advisory Committee. So today I wanted to present the program concept that really came out um, of the Nevada City Fire Safety Ad um, Advisory Committee's effort to prepare the grant proposal. Are you guys seeing my slides okay? Yep. Okay, and it looks like one big slide. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> you don't see my notes, that's great. Um, so in writing the proposal together, we developed more of a programmatic approach. Um, and the goal of this presentation today is to get the council feedback on this program approach and to get approval for the use of a GoFundMe um, campaign to support the proposal. So we do call this the Nevada City Slivers Program. The goal of the City Slivers Program is to develop a long-term strategy for managing vegetation on city sliver properties through a cooperative program between the city and its residents. City slivers are defined as properties in the city limit that are near infrastructure. They're often small patches of land without even a parcel number, but they represent a significant fire risk to city infrastructure. So the program objectives are first to select the city sliver properties for treatment, get those properties treated by a professional landscaping company or volunteers, but to standards and having that be followed up with a maintenance program called Adopt a Sliver. So to accomplish the first objective, the city sliver properties must be mapped and selected. Once selected, the properties can be on a wish list for funding. We envision a Google form that residents can access from the city website to submit parcels to the wish list. Again, this approach is for the in-town city sliver properties as opposed to the larger acreages that the city owns. To get properties treated, bids will be solicited from licensed landscaping companies that will be contracted by the city to do the work. The treatments will be done to Nevada City fire safety standards. And at the completion of their treatment, Chief Goodspeed or another city official will inspect the properties. Once the properties are treated, then they are up for adoption. The adopt a sliver project is essentially a maintenance agreement between a landowner and the city. It will include standards of maintenance and a way for the landowner to end the adoption if their life changes and they're long, no longer able to maintain the property. And will also clarify that the city retains ownership. We envision the adopt a sliver project to have an interactive GIS map on the city website that can be updated with the parcel status so that residents can see when treatment is scheduled which parcels are on the wish list and which are adopted. We also hope that there will be a fun way to put signs on sliver properties to say thank you and adopted by. So just an update or a summary of where we're at today. The city applied for the state fire assistance WUI grant in October, 2020 for $7,575 to treat four properties. This grant program requires a 50% match. We're requesting approval to pursue a GoFundMe account to raise the other half of the money needed to treat these properties. And if we raise more than that, to use those funds on future city sliver parcels. We'd like to start the GoFundMe account for the city sliver program uh, this month, if we can. Uh, we've drafted the language and we'd be glad to have your review. Uh, finally, the Nevada City Fire Safety Committee continues to look for additional grants for this effort and we will of course keep you posted. So the last thing I'll show you is a map of the four city sliver um, properties that were part of the state fire assistance WUI grant, as well as the Spring Street property that was just treated by volunteers. Great, thank you, Carrie. Okay, I'm gonna bring this back to council for questions. Um, Dwayne? Why is it taking us so long to figure this out? I'm excited. <laughs> this is great. Wish we would have done this 20 years ago. Um, no, thank you so much for the open-minded approach and uh, coming up with this. These, these slivers have been there forever. And uh, I think this is the best solution we have short of coming up with a way to put a, 
tiny affordable home on some of the slivers long term. So we actually have a property owner uh, when we get to the point that we can maybe find a way with Amy's help to turn some of these into lots. But for the meantime, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, Doug. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful, innovative a way to, uh, you know, help the city maintain its property. And, and you know, we're very appreciative of that. And, and especially the volunteer hours that everybody's putting in. You know, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, Carrie and Terry and Richard and, and the mayor for, for spearheading this, this uh, committee, which I think is wonderful. And it really nicely dovetails with the fire safe communities. And, you know, and I was a member of the Deer Creek fireside community, which was wonderful until I, I moved, but I, I miss them. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's a wonderful um, program and, and I certainly support it. Thank you. Daniela. Yeah, I just want to commend everybody on their creativity and innovation on this. It's an exciting um, way to navigate a problem. And uh, thank you so much for the time and the energy um, and the thought and the creativity that you put into it. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. So I just want to thank all these wonderful people on this committee. This has been such a pleasure for me. And definitely one of my passions coming on to council was working at a way to make our um, city more fire safe. And I am, have learned so much from everybody on this committee. And I, I, I love you all. <laughs> um, but in this Saturday, this uh, group of people that came out and helped us clean up this little sliver I just seriously, it just touched my heart and it was such a good day and so positive and with COVID and everything else, I needed that. So, you know, thank you all who came out and all the volunteers who showed up. Um, it was really wonderful. And I also want to thank Sam Gitchell for all his support, um, at least in helping me, guiding me through all of this. Um, he was originally the one who came and asked for us to, as a city to step up. And um, I'm really grateful he did. And it's been a pleasure working with him. So anyway, at this point, I am going to move on to subject B, which is to, um, whoops, where's my wording? Sorry. Yeah. Mayor Minette, may I interrupt yes. for a second? Yeah. I have a link to the GoFundMe language that's been drafted. We've not published this anywhere. We've only looked at it as at a committee, but would it be helpful or appropriate to share here in the chat so that people from the council understand what Katrina, did you put that in, you put that in the agenda, didn't you? If I did, good. I don't remember having done that. Um, I uh, don't think so. I don't know that I had that. Okay. Carrie, could you do that, please? Put it in the chat? Yes. Or okay. put it up in, or you want to put it on the screen? Oh, That's sure, it. I can do that too. But I did just put it in the chat and then we don't have to take any more time on it. And if anybody- okay, but we are it, voting on it tonight. So- um, It's a probably long-winded version of what should be there because we like to talk a lot. Carrie, uh -huh. could, you, could you also email that to me directly so we can put it on the website? Yes, doing that right now. Thank you. Okay, so, so. so. So Aaron, we basically discussed item B, or Carrie did. Um, so I think you're just looking for um, uh, passing both of those resolutions that are attached to that right. item. Right. You um, asked for public comment. I don't think we had that yet. Not yet. I haven't yet. So um, the two things on our agenda is to pass a resolution for, um, the city council to establish adopt the sliver volunteer program. And two is a resolution for the city council to approve a GoFundMe campaign for the Nevada City Fire Safety Advisory Committee. So Don, do we have any public comment on this? No, we do not. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask for a motion for um, a resolution for the city council to establish Adopt the Sliver program. 
So if nobody jumps in, I'll just go for a motion to approve resolution 2020 next in order, a resolution of the city council of the city of Nevada city to establish and adopt a sliver volunteer program. Second. Second. Great. Um, and roll call, Katrina. Council member Fleming? Yes. Council member Fernandez? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Manette? Yes. And the second, I need a um, motion to for the GoFundMe campaign. I move to pass a resolution, pass resolution 2020 next in order, a resolution of the city council of the city of Nevada City approving the establishment of a GoFundMe campaign for the Nevada City Fire Safety Advisory Committee's Adopt a Sliver program to raise contributions to match funds requested in the fiscal year uh, 2021 State Fire Assistance WUI grant. Can I get a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Minnett? Yes. And one last thing I'm going to ask you all to advertise it to your friends and family, and let's get it out into the world. So <laughs> thank you. Let's do it. And thank And thank you um, for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Okay, now we're moving on to the consent agenda. We have, sorry, get my paperwork here. Okay, the consent, all matters under the consent calendar are to be considered routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless before the city council votes on a motion to adopt mo members of the city council or the public can request a item to be removed from the consent cal calendar for a separate discussion. On tonight's um, consent calendar, we have A, accounts payable, B, award a contract for the cross street drainage improvement, C, um, land, Bear Yuba Land Trust trail maintenance contract, D, pedestrian Finley commercial street project, E, fourth quarter financial update, F, Action minutes from October 28th, 2020, regular city council meeting. And G, action minutes, November 10th, 2020, special city council meeting. Is there any members from the public that would like to pull an item? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and pull item D. Uh, there was two mem uh, several members of the public that wanted that pulled for um, comment. Okay. Um, anything else from the public? Any others? No. Okay. Um, council members, do you have any item that you would like to pull? No. I do not. Okay. Just to At clarify, we're, we're pulling D or B? D. D the pedestrian-friendly commercial street. Oh, okay. All right. Good. All right. Okay. So at this time, I would like to get a motion to um, to vote on subject A, B, C, E, F, and G. So moved. Seconded. Okay, all in favor, roll call please. Council member Fernandez? Yes. Council member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Minette? Yes. And now let's go to um, subject D, the pedestrian friendly commercial street project. Do you want me just to read those public comments or were you gonna go over the staff report? Um, if Brian's with us. Yeah. Okay, why don't we have the public comment first? Okay. 
So the first is from Miriam Morris. At the last meeting, all the focus on this topic was Commercial Street between Pine and Three Forks. While little to no attention was paid to the rest of the project between Three Forks and Robinson Plaza. I believe there are many flaws to the design in this area and hope they will be resolved through engineering and traffic decisions. It would be wise to create a mock-up of the final design before it goes to bid to see how the changes work in real life. This could be accomplished with paint, barricades, and temporary bollards. Then any glaring deficiencies could be remedied before committed to construction. The next comes from Pamela Meek. As a Nevada City resident, tomorrow night, I would like to request the item D be pulled. Submission of a new alternative map for, re for consideration that suggests closing Commercial Street to through traffic on weekends from Friday evening till Sunday evening to coincide with the annual Saturday market calendar. Tables with umbrellas and chairs would be set up from the area be beginning at Three Forks towards Pine Street to Carrington's slash JJ Jackson's respecting current sidewalk and roadway widths in order to maximize seating and dining area. This proposal maintains existing and much needed parking places Monday through Friday, while also facilitating deliveries of merchant supplies. Because there is now additional time to present this project for funding, the various stakeholders could conduct Zoom meetings outside of city council time to establish consideration of this alternative concept. This proposal is the product of concern for making changes that can't be undone when or if they go out of style. I am making this request to be read as I am not able to get Zoom to work for me. So she had attached a drawing. The next is from Daniel Ketchum. We would appreciate, uh, I guess this is on behalf of the Nevada County Historical Society. We would appreciate it if the council would remove the commercial street item on tonight's agenda so that it can be discussed. The draft map on tonight's agenda in parentheses, nine foot sidewalks alternative is different enough from the previous maps that it requires additional environmental review, particularly in the areas of cultural resources and aesthetic impacts. In addition, we understand that there is a new proposal that preserved the historic scale of commercial street yet allow for walking street in the summer months. We are also interested in discussing the various details on the map in the lower commercial street area below three forks. For these reasons, it seems like a full agendized discussion at a future meeting would be a good idea. I would also appreciate it if you could invite us into the Zoom meeting to comment. We thank you in advance for your careful consideration of the matter. This one's from Lori Overholzer. I would appreciate it if you would remove this item. I've listened to the last council meeting on the nine points as well as the previous council meeting on this issue. It seems to me the direction at the first council meeting was for traditional straight sidewalks. In the second meeting, this was refined by the city council to nine foot sidewalks for the upper portion of commercial in the general direction given to staff. The straight sidewalk direction from the first meeting was clear and Aaron Manette even said no bump outs as I remember. I assume straight sidewalks would continue down the street as a result. The design tonight does not implement that direction and needs revision to be consistent with council direction. At the last city council meeting, the design details of the historic scale alternative were directed by city council to be explored by the city engineer through discussions with the proponents. That discussion occurred, which included discussion of the deletion of all the bump outs and other issues such as pavers and trees in the lower commercial area. None of the lower commercial design detail revisions recommended in the historic scale alternative were included in the new design being reviewed tonight. I hope the bump outs, tree planting or not, and pavers will be part of further discussion of the details permitted for review by the planning commission whenever it is sent back to the commission. The, these details are important to the overall historic character of Commercial Street from top to bottom and are the usual purview of the planning commission. Is that all? Uh, I have one more. I'm just making sure it's not a duplicate. Okay. Um, well, it's from one of the people I already read, and usually they don't get a second chance, but I, I think we haven't been sticking to that. So it's from Pamela again. I was concerned that when all was said and done um, regarding the commercial street revamp, it didn't feel like anyone got what they wanted. 
The Friends of Nevada City Group wanted a traffic-free space to hang out on a regular basis. The historic preservation folks hoped to maintain the century-old streetscapes. The merchants, visitors, and residents lost some much-needed parking places, and the through traffic and delivery vehicles will now find Commercial Street even more narrow than before. Nine-foot wide sidewalks, which are found on Broad Street, two lanes of traffic with parking on both sides, will not be wide enough for tables and umbrellas and passing pedestrians. The Commercial Street Rethink proposal and map introduced a wide, a safe wide street for tables allowing seating, entertainment, and room for energetic children. Following the farmer's market calendar, it would close Commercial Street from Friday evening to Sunday evening, almost half the weekends a year. That is all of public comment. Great, thank you. Yeah, for, <laughs> actually, I, I thought we kind of had decided this at the last meeting. Um, and I thought that um, personally, we um, kind of gave each side a little bit of something. I thought it was a nice compromise. I just want to comment to people talking about the street being closed um, from Friday to Sunday. That was just a suggestion that could happen. So that wasn't, we didn't vote on that. So just to let people know that. Um, the bullards are being put in when we do close down the street for, you know, summer nights, Victorian Christmas, things like that. Um, so, and the street is straight. So I'm a little confused of why they want us to pull this and bring it back. We are on a deadline. Um, so, yeah, that's my comment. I suggest we go ahead and pass this and move on and let the planning commission deal with this um, on their part. So, um, Dwayne? Yeah, I mean, if there are concerns, I think they need to be brought up uh, separately from the meeting to staff. I thought we had compromised last time uh, and we, we literally took 95% of what uh, Funk and the pedestrian friendly folks wanted away. So I thought it was more than a fair compromise with what we came up with personally. Um, and again, if there are details that have slipped through the cracks, we can deal directly with staff on that. The public is welcome. Uh, Mr. Ketchum, the Historical Society, Lori, anybody else, they can bring that up to Brian uh, and or us individually. We can meet at City Hall and go over those details. Um, but I thought we had finally, to a degree, put this to rest as being pretty darn close to what we were all able to live with. Uh, so I, at this point, I'm ready to move forward tonight also knowing that there will still be some details to ham you know, hammer out outside of city council. Daniela? Yeah, I agree with uh, Mayor Manette and uh, Vice Mayor Strasser. Um, I felt like we had at the last meeting a beautiful um, process that led to consensus. Um, and I was really uh, proud of us for having that process. And so I am also uh, ready to move on with what we decided at the last meeting. Doug. I hate to be a fly in the ointment. <laughs> no. Um, so I, I agree with what everybody has said, that we did reach a nice consensus. I think everybody got some. I appreciate uh, Dwayne's point that Funk didn't get as much as what they wanted. You know, originally we had this idea that we would maintain the versatility of the street. And we thought that nine foot sidewalks would give us some versatility to allow parking in the future. And, you know, whether we wanted to, so, you know, to have more than one option, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. It, it seems now with nine foot sidewalks that we, we are limiting ourselves somewhat on what we can do in the future. Um, you know, I didn't see the, the, the bulb outs, you know, I, I think that as far as I understand it, Brian, the, the street, the sidewalks are straight and uh, in uniform on, on both sides. Um, you know, I think we lose a little bit of versatility with the nine foot sidewalks, but I, I think we did uh, go over that pretty well. Brian, did you, were you able to check to see that we can do uh, traffic and parking with the width proposed with the nine foot sidewalks? Did, did you, I, I don't know what the width is for a traffic lane and parking, you know, because that was one of the things that we, we were considering to maintain the versatility of the street for future generations. Because 
you know, my, my son's going to be old enough to, to vote at some point, and he's going to want to change everything, too. So, you know, I think that the extent that we maintain versatility is, is important. Um, all the details of the trees and the benches and the planners, is, that's more of a, of a planning commission thing, I, I think, right? And so we're going to send all those little details back to the planning commission and they opine on those and that's their area of expertise. I really appreciate Dwayne's idea that if members of the public feel that they didn't get their say or things weren't, you know, made uh, according to their wishes and, and they don't feel they got the input, that we do have an option to move on with this from the city council and discuss it individually with community members and uh, Amy and Brian or whoever needs to be involved in that conversation to make sure everybody's feelings are heard on, on all sides of this equation. So I think that's a really good solution that allows us to move on today to kick some of it back to the Planning Commission and to allow the public to come into City Hall in the next you know few weeks to you know raise their concerns and, and I think it's much more of a staff driven issue at this point because we've really uh, I think made a consensus on, on some of this, on, on the important issues. And then, you know, the fine points can be worked out. And I'm sorry, Brian, to put this on you and Amy, but, you know, if people want to come in and, and, and iron out these little fine points, because I think there are some nuances here that I don't want to get into right now, but you've heard them, we've heard them from sort of both sides. And so as long as they have the opportunity to come in and, and speak with you about those and, and be heard, I think that that's fair for everybody. Um, I, I could I, answer. Go ahead, um, Brian. <clears throat> uh, just to quickly answer some of Doug's questions. Um, when we decided on the nine foot sidewalks, I thought that we were not planning for parking on, on the section that we have bollards on. And we're adding park, parking elsewhere. We're adding some parking at the intersection of Main and commercial and union um, that's correct brian I, I was just talking about 20 years from now if right. things change can we do parking in, in the street and and i think that was one of the you know that was one of my concerns and i think we we've dealt with that somewhat i just was hoping that that would allow us to do both of those things in the distant future not really. um it wouldn't quite have enough width for parking and it it could be possible to add parking in the future but it would require um modifying the curb yeah at that time yeah. so, so that that section would with this proposal wouldn't quite be wide enough for parking it'd be really tight okay fair with enough fast trucks and so forth and then as far as the bulb outs um nothing about that change we, we used um option b that was presented last time mm -hmm. and then um made the modifications that you directed us to do at the last meeting with straight curbs, nine foot sidewalks, gray colored pavers, removed the four trees from the upper part of commercial. And the, the bulb outs were not changed because um, it wasn't really specifically discussed last time, but it could be something we look at with planning commission because we're gonna be talking to planning commission about several items anyway sure. so yeah i think a lot of this really is more planning commission the details you know i think we've gotten a general concept that that's sort of the, the council's purview and i think mm -hmm. we've reached a, a good consensus on that and i think that the finer points could be hammered out uh you know again sorry sorry <laughs> Brian, <laughs> maybe, but with you guys better yeah. than us you know spinning around on this again you know i i think that, that would be the best way so that's my two cents thanks great thank great. you I just want to ask, because I, I did say, when we talked about this last time, I was talking about um, no bump outs onto Commercial Street for any one restaurant. And I don't see that in there. That's correct, right, Brian? No, it's it's no, there's no extra sidewalks in front of any one business. It's just okay. nine feet across to all of them. And it's even between all the way. So yeah. the where do we have bump outs? I'm sorry. I guess I was just looking at Commercial Street. Well, so. I think what what some of the 
comments were related to was um, at the at the corners of the uh, where we have crosswalks. Uh -huh. The sidewalk bulbs out, and it's kind of a. It's, it's kind of done. It's a safety thing, right, Brian? I mean, yeah, we... it's done purposely for traffic calming, but it needs to fit in the historic context, okay. you know. So I'd like to get planning commission's input on that. So that's what I just want to clarify. So that goes back to planning commission. That's not really us. Yeah. That'd okay. Be... Great. And, and I just, can I just clarify though that because it's city property, the final decision will land still at the city. Um, it, it's these details are generally um, made by the planning commission when it's private property, but because we've got a, a city property and, and you guys are welcome just to take the planning commission's recommendation, but, um, but, and they'll do sort of more of the heavy lifting on the, the researching and that kind of thing, which is generally oh. the review, but it will, Amy, it will come back to you. Sorry. Oh, but does this, okay. So is this stopping us from moving forward? No, I, I think Brian has what he needs to, to move forward with, with his application. Um, it would just be the final details that would go back to the planning commission for their input on material okay. details, um, you know, color and that kind of thing. Great, great. Okay, can I get a motion? So moved. Um, second, please. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, Katrina. I didn't ask if there was any other public comment. Is there any other public comment on this? No, I don't have any additional public comment. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Who did, this, who did the second on that? I'm sorry, I missed that. Was it Doug? Thank you. Okay, um, all in favor, roll call, please. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Minette? Yes. Okay, department requested action items and update reports. A, LAFCO, Nevada City, Sphere of Influence. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, at the June 27th, 2018 meet meeting, council was advised of an updated scope of work by LAFCO's consultant, Kim Lee Horn, to, to prepare an EIR pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, necessary for the Nevada City Sphere of Influence update. Um, at the July 23rd meeting, staff reported to Council on LAFCO's release of the notice of availability for the draft DIR, um, which started a 45-day public review period, which actually started on June 19th and ended August 3rd, though um, the, the City Council did make comment or was, was given the opportunity to make comment at their meeting on August 12th. Um, Council determined not to, or opted not to make any comment, in part because um, the, the the EIR de does acknowledge the city's uh, objection and preference for our current sphere. So this was um, just really to let you guys know that the final EIR came out. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, the final EIR came out, which is really just a response. It's it's a um, response to all the comments that came as part of the draft EIR. Excuse me. And um, so this, so they are they are hearing the sphere update tomorrow, and um, the EIR will be um, on the agenda, uh, which was something they have to take action on before they can take action on the sphere update. Okay, thank you, Amy. Okay, um, I'm going to put it out for public comment at the moment. Let's see what we've got. Okay. So from Eileen Jorgensen, I write to us that you keep the Nevada City sphere of influence as it is. My family and I bought our property in the sphere because we were comfortable with Nevada City's oversight on our county owned property. We do not want change to the green wooden enclosure which the sphere around Nevada City ensures. As a historic town, this buffer is vital to our rural quality of life and tourism. The next is from Patrick Dyer. Regarding my support of maintaining the existing sphere of influence for Nevada City, I forgot to mention, um, oh, okay, apparently he has an actual comment. Oh, there it is, sorry. 
please vote to maintain the existing sphere of influence for Nevada City. The sphere can help to maintain Nevada City character and charm. The next is from Helen Crawford. I am a 28 year resident of Willow Valley and a business owner in Nevada City. I am asking LAFCO to keep the Nevada City sphere of influence the same. Linda Horning, I am one who lives in the, Nevada, in the Willow Valley area who is in favor of Nevada City reducing their sphere of influence. Susan Oswald and Alan Mowry, my husband and I hope you will keep the sphere of influence as it is and as it is and not reduce the area. Tom Barkis and Chantel Biaghi, please, please keep the Nevada City sphere of influence as it is. There's like 14, but they're all real short like this. Okay, well, keep going. Yeah, there, there's no need for any changes. Uh, the next is from Lori Oberholzer. I hope you will support the many, many city, city and sphere residents who have spoken up for the last four years in favor of retaining the Nevada City sphere of influence. We filled the Root Center twice at LAFCO meetings and sent over 100 emails in on the subject. There is a passion out there for our sphere. The final EIR and the final proposed sphere of influence plan now, after more than four years, are finally complete. Up until now, it has been it has all been discussions and drafts. The final reports show no overriding reason to reduce the sphere's influence, the city's sphere. No reason to remove lower banner lava cap, our Deer Creek watershed ridge lines north and south, Willow Valley along Deer Creek, or the western entry to the city. LAFCO will make its final vote tomorrow. Now is the time for the city to take a final stand for its sphere of influence. A council vote has not been needed until now. Our existing sphere is called the city recommended alternative in the reports because the city asked LAFCO to consider it in the EIR. Let's keep recommending it. I hope you'll vote to send a recommendation via a Zoom oral comment, email comment. Please ask LAFCO to retain the city's existing sphere of influence. Patricia Nelson. We, you know there are lots of things that can be improved or fixed. The Nevada City sphere of influence isn't one of them. It has and still is working just fine. Please ask, once again, ask LAFCO to adopt the existing Nevada City sphere and please read this letter at your meeting. Catherine Billheimer, I am writing to ask that the city council keep the Nevada City sphere of influence as it is. I have been to all the meetings and you need to honor the voices that have loudly spoken to keep the sphere as it is. Uh, Paul Jorgensen, I live within the Nevada City sphere and am a business owner in Nevada City, and I strongly encourage Nevada City to stand up for the current boundaries. Jackie Wiles, please keep the Nevada City sphere of influence as it is. Seems as though the public gathers and states their opinion, then the powers that be vote the way they want. pg and &E, NID, etc. Please acknowledge our opinions. Paul Matson, as a former city council member of 20 years and LAFCO commissioner of 15 years, I believe agreeing to the proposed deletion of much of the Banner Lava Cap area from the city's sphere of influence is a huge mistake. I attached the proposed map and it is note, noted as DS Canal slash Pittsburgh Road. This area is in the Deer Creek watershed. The original basis for including it in the Nevada city sphere, just as Grass Valley sphere is based on the Wolf Creek watershed. This area of Banner Mountain is served by Nevada City schools, parks and trails systems, plus city shopping services and employment opportunities. The addresses are five digit addresses. It is, if it is removed from our sphere, we lose our right to ask for much of anything when development occurs within it. By way of example, some years ago when Deer Creek Park 2 was approved, Nevada City was deeded from the developer 40 acres of the headwaters of Little Deer Creek, our water source. When building permits were pulled for this project, Nevada City will receive $200,000 for the traffic impacts the project will have on Boulder Street. The EIR shows that there is not much of an impact with the original sphere nor the recommended new one. There's no compelling, compelling reason for change. Nevada City needs to stand up and fight to retain this important area. The city, the day after your city council meeting, LAFCO is voting on the EIR and its sphere of influence. Simply accepting and filing the EIR is a mistake. Comments are still being accepted and there is an important opportunity to testify during the meeting. 
This is from Sally Harris. I continue to have concerns about the requested variances on this project as stated in my letter of October 13th. While I would support the variance on the West Broad Street frontage, anything else on the property should conform to our laws and those of the state of California. That, that one's actually part of Sorry, that's not right this one. <laughs> um, this is from Richard and Teresa Thomas. I encourage Nevada City to continue to advocate for our existing sphere of influence. It is, I believe, well-established, geographical, logical, and recognizes the force of gravity. And I think that's all we have on this item. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna make a comment first and then I'll move on. Um, I totally support us in keeping our sphere of influence the way it is. I think we are a very small town and we are impacted greatly by what happens around us. Um, from my understanding, we didn't put this on for, it's not, we don't vote on accepting this um, report. So, and I've had a number of people ask us to, um, ask for a vote of support. And, you know, I'm willing to call for that. I just don't know if it's really going to help. I think that I hope everybody comes to the LAFCO meeting tomorrow and expresses their concern. I would love, since I sit on the LAFCO board, it would be wonderful if another council member could um, maybe show up and give the point of view of this council after mm -hmm. we hear everybody. So um, I think this is important. And, you know, this, the citizens of this city have been fighting for this for a long time. And I, I don't see a good reason to um, reduce our sphere of influence. And the report didn't tell me, uh, give me a good reason either. So um, I also feel that now that we've passed Measure M, which we've added um, sewer and water pipes, Somebody said, oh, that's not for um, new ones, but after time, they won't be new. They will be old and we have a way of serving the community. So um, I think that makes it even a better argument why we should keep our sphere of influence. So I'm gonna move on to um, Dwayne. I guess I'd like to clarify with uh, Amy and or Chrissy again, how much or how little other than just voicing our opinion to LAFCO, um, how much or how little control do we have over this legally? I've been told from day one that we don't. All we can do is advocate for ourselves. Um, but a lot of these folks, they write the letters as if we need to stand up for it. Well, we can verbally, but please clarify how much or how little uh, input we actually have over this process. Yeah, the, the LAFCO, or sorry, the sphere of influence is completely a, a LAFCO purview item. So we, we have no say, we, we have, um, and you know, we've commented on, on you know, our, and made our objections pretty clear at the very beginning of the process. Um, and th that was carried through in, in the EIR and um, in the way they've written their staff report. So um, I think they understand that the city, you know, prefers to keep the sphere the way it is. Um, and and their, their preferred alternative was sort of a consensus, sort of a, a bridging of, what their original intent was to, to slash quite a bit more of our sphere, um, and um, and you know somewhere in between that and um, and what the city would like to to keep. Will we have staff at the meeting tomorrow? I mean, I'm assuming again only two council members can attend. Is this a Brown Act issue uh, with Aaron already sitting there, or can we all show up and voice our opinion? Uh, and will we have staff there tomorrow to reiterate that opinion? Uh, I, believe, I will be there and I believe Brian will be there in case they have questions um, for, for us about um, anything in the, in the um, in, you know, any part of the, the um, EIR, because uh, they, did, they did pull from a lot of city documents. So can Chrissy, can, can anybody, can we all show up from council? You can, since it's a noticed meeting that the public will be invited to. So it's not Can't a conflict a of the Brown Act. Correct? I'm sorry. It's not a conflict with the, it's not a conflict of the Brown Act. No, you, 
you don't you don't have to notice three uh, all of you can go to their meeting because it's a noticed meeting that's they're in compliance with the brown act you can all be there Thank okay you. great and what time is the meeting again the meeting is at 9 30 tomorrow via zoom and you can get to the zoom uh invite through lafco's website so on on um I think it's on the county. Yeah, it's on the county's website, and then go to LAFCO departments and uh, LAFCO, and then there's a link there that you can click on to get to the Zoom invite. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Dwayne? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, Daniela, I have nothing to add. Um, I'm going to do my best to be there in the morning. Great. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, I, you know, we don't, this is another situation where we don't have a lot of power, but I think that we're being asked by the public to really, and, and I realize that we're, you know, Danielle and I are sort of coming in late to the game on this, but I, I think it's important that we make a statement as many times. I know our feelings have been expressed. They, they know we don't want to give up our sphere. I think that it can't hurt to make a statement tonight. I only can be at the uh, meeting tomorrow for a half an hour. I have to go we have our big holiday distribution for the food bank, all hands on deck. So we're giving out 900 turkeys. So uh, I'm gonna be in there for a half an hour, but I will write a public comment in as, a, as a, a council member. And I just hope we can just take a vote tonight to say to LAFCO, hey, please consider our, our you know opinions that we've expressed over the time and the, the opinions of our citizens and residents who have expressed you know, uh, complete objections to you know, what they're proposing. And certainly to look at some of these uh, important areas if they're going to carve out uh, some stuff against us. Uh, so uh, I, I, I know that the vote is just going to be symbolic. It's not going to have any teeth in it, but I think that it would go, you know, a good way to showing that we still are trying to fight this fight down to the last minute, which is tomorrow at 930. So Chrissy, can we do a can we do a vote saying the entire council supports supports LAFCA, supports us wanting to keep our complete sphere of influence as yeah, I think you, you can as a matter of policy. Amy was right. The government code gives the LAFCO the authority to determine the sphere of influence and make amendments. So you just don't have the authority, you know, and maybe that's something you just need to, we can tell to the public so that they know. And from what I understand, I, we, the council at the time was before my time, but did negotiate as much as possible with LAFCO and they just, just right. you know, didn't choose to leave the sphere like the city council wanted and so there's you don't have you don't have authority to override LAFCO's decision and I know that this is really a vote of all of just saying that the that council has is saying that to LAFCO we are asking for you to vote to keep our sphere of influence the way it is Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what's on the agenda there. I mean, you're certainly you're it's legal to do that. It may not be um, exactly relevant to what's on their agenda tomorrow. Although, I mean, if they're approving their EIR, then maybe they're also approving the, the sphere or yeah. Amy can let you know what the stage of the process is. But if they've already approved the sphere, then it, you may have kind of missed the last opportunity to say that again. But you can always put, you know, put it in the record. But yeah, both both items, the the EIR and the Sphere update itself, is is are are on the agenda tomorrow. That would make sense with the EIR being on there. So yeah, even though they've gone through the process of consulting with the city and county and cities, yeah. So that that would be relevant to their agenda tomorrow if they have the Sphere decision on their agenda. Okay, and I'm okay with being redundant, um, but I just want to be clear. There was a meeting in August where we were able to submit feedback, right? Council feedback right. to let them know how we feel. So that has been done. I'm okay with being redundant and doing it again, um, but just wanted to name that. Yes, you are right, Daniela. That's exactly what we did. But I think the community is asking us to be redundant. And so, uh, Doug, I'm going to ask you to make a motion. Um, I make a motion that the council 
a vote to, to recommend to LAFCO to keep our sphere of influence intact as is. Uh, and that we send this message to LAFCO for the meeting before the meeting tomorrow. Second. Okay. All in favor, roll call, please. Katrina? Council Member Fleming? Here. Council Member Fernandez? Uh, yes. Vice oh, yes. Mayor Strasser? Sorry, yes. yes. Mayor Manette? Yes. Okay, thank you. And that, just for clarification, how, how would you like that to be delivered? Do you want, would, do you want staff to write up something and send it to, to SR? I, I'm not sure. Or do you just want, um, it's, do you want staff or, or a council member to make a public comment on behalf of the council? I, I think it would be really great if you could send it from, uh, the staff could write up a quick blurb and send it to SR, because we're all gonna, in, at least I'm gonna individually make a comment as well. And you know that's the best we can do at this point. And it, I mean, it literally, it's all you have to do is say that last night council took a vote asking the LAFCO committee to keep our sphere of influence the way it is, okay. you know, and, um, and I think, I, go ahead. Sorry. I think that the, the, the new thing here is the current council because other councils have voted on this before. And so the current <coughs> council is, is of the same mind as everybody else has been or the new council. Anyway. And I, you know, it's like I'm mayor of Nevada city, but I'm also on the LAFCO committee. So I have two different hats there. Um, but at the moment, I'm an alternate, so I'm actually not voting tomorrow. So I think that gives me a little room to make a comment also. Okay. Um, okay, so um, thank you all. I appreciate that. Who now, did, who, Mayor, who did the second on that um, vote? I did, Dwayne. Thank you. So, Dwayne, you're going to be there tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I will plan on it. Great. Danielle mm -hmm. also said, so great. Thank you all. Um, okay, we're going to move on to um, subject B, Joint Power Agreement and Bylaws of the California Governmental Risk Authority, which permits the merger of public agency risk sharing authority of California and the Redwood Empire Municipal Insurance Fund. Um, okay, uh, so the, the city belongs to um, the Public Agency Risk Sharing Authority, which is, is um, acronym with is PARSAC, um, for uh, liability uh, coverage. Um, we belong with about 34 other um, agencies in that pool. Um, as far as um, the, the pool has a board and it, it's made up of one, one member of each member city, and at this point, um, for some time, as part of their their the pool's business model, um, they, they've been looking to expand and or merge or whatever made sense for the pool to um, do a little bit more with economies of scale and um, to just move a little bit more into what you will this this more current climate where. Um, where pools are merging together, we're seeing a reduction in them and um, more pools combining that have like philosophies. And so uh, PARSAC has, has spent the better part of the time that I've been on the board, which has been since I became an employee of Nevada City. And uh, they did find a, um, another pool, uh, the Redwood Empire, Empire Municipal Insurance Fund that um, they started looking at, I think it's been about two years now um, for a merger. So at this point, the, um, the, the board of PARSAC and the board of REMIF have developed an agreement and uh, bylaws based on the fact that um, the merger makes sense. Uh, all same coverages will be provided. The pools have like philosophies um, and it just, it's a good, um, it's a good fit for the pools to merge together. Uh, they will, the name will change to the California Intergovernmental Risk Authority. So 
It will no longer be Parsec, it will be CIRA. Uh, what you're doing tonight is passing a resolution to give me the authority to sign the, the new JPA for CIRA and to sign the bylaws. And I was, um, as, as a board member, I was involved in this process in um, vetting this and um, discussing with the other member agencies the, uh, the merger of these two pools. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put this out to the public first. Do we have any public comment on this? No, no public comment on this one. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the table. Dwayne? Nope, it makes sense. Uh, all insurance uh, industry kind of organizations are uh, combining nowadays. They're, you know, they're getting more efficient, strength in numbers. So um, I understand it. It looks like it will work in our favor. Um, Doug? Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, consolidating, uh, you know, companies to manage risk is, it makes sense. And, and you know, hopefully it brings some, us a, a little better pricing structure, maybe, and maybe they'll cover our trees when they fall on the street. <laughs> um, yes, I, I'm all for it. So. Daniela? Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. I have nothing new to add. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. So I'm going to call for a motion. Um, motion to approve uh, resolution 2020 next in order, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Nevada City adopting the Joint Powers Agreement, JPA, and bylaws for California, California Intergovernmental Risk Authority, CIRA, which permits the merger of Public Agency Risk Sharing Authority of California, known as PARSAC, and the Redwood Empire Municipal Insurance Fund, known as REMIF, and authorizing the city manager to sign. Can I get a second? Second. Um, all in favor, roll call, please, Katrina. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Minette? Yes. And it passes. Okay. Now we're moving on to subject C, extreme war weather shelter um, MOU. Uh, since about 2010, the city's allowed Sierra Roots, um, sometimes working with other organizations, to use city facilities for the purposes of an extreme weather shelter for the homeless when weather conditions have met criteria. Uh, we're bringing forward the, um, the agreement that the, the MOU that has been adopted the last two years. It did go, go through some changes um, a couple years ago. Um, this year, we're, we have not made any changes except to update the dates for the current year. And also um, the county has added COVID-19 COVID precaution language in it and uh, the protocols that need to be uh, followed when uh, the shelter is opened. Uh, the big change this year, and we have Mike Dent here and Paul Cogley as well um, to answer any questions, but the big change uh, for this upcoming um, weather cold weather season is that the priority will now be um, motels first so um, the county with uh, Sierra Roots has um, put a uh, I, I think is in a contract with Northern Queen to provide a specific number of rooms for um, sheltering the homeless during extreme weather events and um, what we'll be doing is if those, if those um, rooms become filled, the uh, veterans building would be the overflow for the um, remaining, uh, for the remaining people that they do not have rooms for at the Northern Queen. It is limited. My understanding, I believe, is it's approximately 15 people that will be allowed with the COVID um, protocols at the veterans building, which is limiting uh, because that does include volunteers. And um, I think that that's, a, I think that's about it that's changing this year. But again, Mike and Paul are here to answer any other specific questions about the program for this upcoming um, winter. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any public comment on this? No, I do not have any public comment on this one. So I'm going to bring it back to the table. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I do. 
Okay. I just have one from Paul Carner. After being given funding by the County of Nevada to house the homeless, both veterans and seniors were left on the streets by Sierra Roots. Sierra Roots was discriminated against has discriminated against veterans for years while certain members of the Nevada City Police then ticket and harass these veterans. First, I'm asking the council to refer zero routes to the much larger city of Grass Valley for their cold weather shelter as it attracts criminals to Nevada City and certain police will not protect the citizens from said criminals. Second, I'm asking the city to be willing to work with the home team, a county agency, in the future when dealing with the homeless. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm coming back to the table um, for questions. And thank you, Mike, for being here and Paul. Um, so, uh, Dwayne, do you have any questions? No, I, I think it's great that we're continuing the program and that the county has been so involved the last couple of years with us. Uh, that's really, again, boosted the level of uh, quality service we can provide that we couldn't without the county's assistance. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Doug? Um, yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, you know, uh, I just, I, first of all, this is, you know, this is probably the biggest thing that Nevada City does for its homeless population, aside from some of the work that uh, Chief Alice did on Sugarloaf Mountain and, and stuff that the home team does. So it's very exciting that we're supporting this and continuing to support it. Uh, I, I echo uh, Dwayne's comment about the county participation and making this a stronger program. Um, couple things, and, and I know that this has already been litigated and I just want to touch on it and I just need to understand. The temperature criteria I know is a state mandate. However, we do have ability as a county and as a city to adjust that. Has there been any conversation about that? I mean, three days at 32 degrees or 30 degrees, you know, and, and I know that this has come up before. So you know, what's, what's the, what's the standard answer for this? <laughs> Paul, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'll make this brief. Uh, Mike Dent, director of housing and community services in Nevada County. Uh, Council member Fleming. Good evening. The criteria can be set locally by cities and counties. It is a, a wide range. We did a survey about three years ago. We're actually on the lower end of activation trigger points. Um, for an example, uh, here it's 30 degrees or snow on the ground, 32 degrees up in Truckee, it's 15 degrees. So there's a big difference in, um, when we pull the trigger on activating, we haven't discussed changing that, that, um, um, temperature as part of this MOU this year. Uh, however, as, uh, Katrina mentioned, we're expanding our efforts right now, you know, both in Truckee and here to acquire mo uh, motel rooms in exchange for a congregate living environment since we can't really do that this year. Well, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate that. Um, how many people are, are, are we uh, contracted to house over at the Northern Queen right now? And so when does the overflow situation come up for Vets Hall or the Siemens Lodge? Well, I, I think I'll, I can answer that. I've been, I'm the coordinator over there. Uh, we, uh, since November 2nd, we've had a, a program of homeless people and working in a collaborative with um, the county and with Hospitality House. Uh, there has been, uh, we have 30 rooms, probably about 40 people because, you know, we have couples there and also there's uh, a couple of minor uh, children there too. So um, that's pretty full. Um, this evening, I got a call uh, I, I've been getting a lot of calls that, about that program uh, from people who would like to be in it. And uh, I got a call today from somebody who was just uh, released from Sierra Memorial Hospital with pneumonia. And um, we couldn't take them at Northern Queen. And I called uh, two motels and they were full. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's quite something. Uh, last week, uh, I must have had five people at the Nevada City Inn in addition to uh, Northern Queen. Uh, but we have learned how to, how to adapt um, uh, keeping the homeless uh, sheltered in cold weather like it was last week. And, um, uh, you know, by using motel, the motel model, it seems, uh, you know, we're learning about it. Uh, we, we began our, our, our uh, learning curve last March, just before the lockdown, we were already social distancing at the Betts Hall when we opened up. So it's a it, the need is, is very great, and uh, it's a, I, I also want to uh, 
say how, how much I appreciate. Um, I'm, I'm an old resident of Nevada City. I live on 412 South Pine Street, and I am proud of my city for uh, keeping this venue, the, uh, the Vets Hall, available for the homeless in the winter days. Mm -hmm. I might add also that we are you the county places not just in Nevada City. We have multiple multiple placements inside the county and in the city of Grass Valley. In addition to our efforts with Zero Roots, that's great, Paul. It sounds like you guys are housing people anyway, regardless of the 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 cold you know the temperature conditions. Is that true? Yeah, we we do that on a uh, uh, we have some funding for to put people into motels, such as the the case uh, this evening, uh, a fellow named William who uh, had pneumonia, That's and uh, and so uh, yeah, uh, if um, if there's a minor children involved, if there's a, a, a disabled disability uh, where it would be very unsafe for them to be outside, um, um, or somebody's recovering from, from the flu or something, uh, a motel room will be provided if we if we can. That's wonderful. I, I appreciate the work you do. And one last question. Um, so, you know, I read through the MOU and everything, and there's a big security component. There's, you know, obviously coordinators on site as well. Um, you know, I, I think you guys have the security sort of down and, you know, in the policies as far as in and out and, and you know, bringing in outside bad stuff in. Who is going to be responsible for enforcing the COVID requirements under this new I mean, is that going to be something that you guys are going to handle in house there with your security and, and the coordinators, or is this something that the city is going to have to come in and help with? Um, you know, just as far as compliance masks and all that right now, especially in the current you know climate, is that something that is done in house, or I mean, it has been thought out, or, or or what's the what's the enforcement mechanism on that? We're we're talking about this a lot. We have a no touch thermometer we'll, we'll use if anybody is uh, has uh, says that they're sick, they'll be asked if they if they feel well when they can and uh, register in. Uh, I think today even the county had a PPE. Um, uh, um, they were giving away masks. You could sign up organizations in Nevada City County could sign up to get masks and uh, uh, you know, yeah. gloves and that. So my concern is more that if you guys have a problem with somebody who refuses to wear a mask and let's say they go inside and they, they take their mask off, they're in distress, something's going on. And, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. And is it, is it something, you know, I mean, if it gets, you know, a little difficult, what happens? Because this is coming up a lot and, and I just wanted to understand if there's, if there's any thought about that. Yeah, we're, we're prepared for that. I think we have, um, um, we have what we call community liaisons who are actually security people and they check the bags as people come in. They're very good. They're very low key. Uh, they get, uh, they engage with the homeless people. It's not like a, a heavy handed security guard, um, uh, you know, um, scene going on there, but they also do, um, do enforce the rules. We have to have the rules enforced and it's very important because uh, some people will, will, uh, you know, um, we'll watch what the others are doing, and there's kind of peer, uh, you know, peer pressure. If if the uh, if everybody's following rules and wearing masks, um, somebody who might be inclined to take theirs off might not do that. So we do follow those rules, you know, and make sure that they're really, um, you know, applied to everybody. Um, Sounds so like you have it uh, well under uh, under control, Paul. Yeah. So I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate Mike the the, the county's partnership in this and I think that this is just a wonderful alliance that you know needs to be expanded when there's funding and there's a change in, in the criteria so thank you both you bet. thank you Daniela yeah I agree that this is a wonderful alliance and I want to thank you guys for your work in making this happen each year I think it's really really necessary for our community um, a couple of things I just wanted to note uh, Paul you said that uh, people will be um, you know, you'll use the thermometer if people don't feel well, just a suggestion that maybe the thermometer is for everyone as they enter, um, regardless of feeling well or not, just a thought. Um, and then also, uh, I appreciate that we have higher temperatures um, uh, criteria than Trekkie, twice as high, right? Um, and I would love for us to consider um, adjusting that just because 33 degrees is really cold. 
Um, and it's really cold to be out on the streets and, and also so is 40 degrees. So um, just just would love to see that um, uh, adjusted at some point when, when possible. Right. If I might add, uh, it's a, my understanding every person coming in will be temperature checked and every person needs to follow the PPE recommendations by public health. And indeed, we will have a public health nurse there monitoring uh, Casey from the home team who is a, a, another valued partner, both in our motel placements and in overflow, will be there to double check, make sure we're following the public health guidelines. Great, thank you. Great, and do you have, um, I guess I volunteer at the warming shelter um, and what's the protection for your volunteers? We have, um, uh, we have uh, surveyed our volunteers. Uh, a lot of volunteers are not participating this year. We trained about 45 and had uh, volunteers pre-COVID last, just last fall, 2019. That's a, a long time ago now, one, one year ago, pre, pre-COVID era. Yeah. Uh, but we have, a, we have a, uh, the, the, the shelter will be um, you know, uh, limited to 15 and, uh, and uh, rather than the, we, pre-COVID, we would have up to 30 at, at the uh, shelter. So that is, um, uh, you know, in consideration. They, um, so it's, uh, of course, we, uh, being COVID safe is, is as important for the volunteers as it is for the, for the homeless who, who use this service. And uh, uh, the same, you know, the rules that apply um, to, uh, to the homeless are also applied to, to volunteers. We, you know, the masks and the distancing. I think uh, Casey, we, um, Mike and I were there with Casey uh, last week and with Alice Johnson, who's our coordinator for this program. And uh, we discussed uh, how the dining will be because at last March when we did this the first time the, we had the cots six feet apart, head to toe, it worked really well. The dining wasn't as wasn't as successful. Uh, people were used to dining the old way, and this time uh, uh, we figured out a plan to make sure that it's as safe as you know, and, and we'll meet all the criteria and the protocols. Okay, and um, do you guys have enough PPE for the volunteers also? Well, yes, yes, and if we run low, I can get more. Okay, I just I'm asking because. Um, and I just want to clarify it because I think I may have heard this wrong. Did you say at the hotel you already have 30 people at the hotel? Yes. So do you have room for more? We would go to other motels. <laughs> it's, okay. it's called pulsing. We would start basically calling every motel in, in the county to try to find some room. Okay. First, before we did the overflow. Okay. And Maybe we can move to Airbnb. The people at the hotel are, are people who are, are getting prepared for, for housing opportunities too. So uh, okay. we hope some of those rooms open up over the next few weeks. Okay, and can I ask, is the person who just got out of the hospital, do you find him a room? I found him a room for tomorrow night. He had a tent and uh, he said he would spend the night in the tent. I called uh, Grass Valley uh, Motels, everybody was full. I called him back and he said, uh, and told him that I couldn't, I couldn't get him in a motel tonight, but I will tomorrow. Oh God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. It's not good. Okay. Um, thank you both so much. I really appreciate everything that you're doing. And, you know, this is, um, yeah. And, you know, I wish that we had more available and I know it's really scary in this time of COVID to be doing this and figuring out the safest way. So thank you both for mm -hmm. working on this. And so, okay, can I get a motion to approve this MOU? So moved. Um, second, please. Second. second. And all in favor, roll call, Katrina. Unmute yourself, Katrina. Thanks. Um, Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. 
Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Manette? Yes. And that was Strasser, you made the motion and Fleming did the second, correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Paul. Right. Well, thanks. Okay. Next subject is Nevada City Christmas tree. Good evening, Council. Good evening. I uh, just wanted to kind of update you guys on uh, the Christmas tree. Uh, the city removed the old Christmas tree June 20th, 2019, because it was diseased and had become a public safety hazard. The Christmas tree was in Callahan Park and was lit up every, every year. For the Christmas season of 2019, this Nevada City Chamber of Commerce donated and put a Christmas tree up in Robinson Plaza. This year, the city has purchased a 14-foot pre-lit tree to be placed in Robinson Plaza to contribute and supporting sprucing up the downtown for the holiday season. The city will be working on a more permanent plan for the future holiday seasons, which will include having fresh cut trees to be placed in the Robinson Plaza. And the fiscal impact of that was just $930 for the purchase of the tree. Um, I'll jump in there. Um, we brought this forward just so you all know, so you can respond just in case you get any public input because we have in previous um, holiday, during previous holiday seasons, since we did cut the, the tree in Callanan Park, we have had complaints about um, not having a large Christmas tree, a live Christmas tree. Um, we've had suggestions of Christmas trees that, or of trees that people would like to see lit up that are just um, not it's not possible because they're not on our properties or you know, they're Caltrans trees or whatnot. So this is so you all, if you get any input or uh, complaints, if you will, from the public or, or whatnot, um, just so you know how we're, how, how we're handling it this year. And then we're looking for more permanent uh, and live solutions in the future. Yeah, it sounds smart that we didn't cut down a fresh tree this year anyway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. <laughs> Did anyone see the video of the Rockefeller Center tree? Them yeah. putting it up. It looked so nice, and then they got it situated, and there was all like had holes in it, and it just like it looked like the most pathetic, saddest tree, which was just seemed so perfect for 2020. <laughs> Go, Charlie. Okay. Great. Um, anybody else would like to comment on this? No, thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, Baba. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Bubba. Great. Now let's move on to reinstatement of Mayor. Mayor, what? I'm sorry to interrupt. I am wondering. I, I don't know how long this next item will take, but the rabbi has been waiting for item F. Is Absolutely. It possible to switch those two. I am, do not mind at all. Sorry, Chad. Thank so. you. Ron. So I'm going to switch this around and we're going to go to um, the fifth annual Memorial Lighting Street Closure. And thank you for being here, Rabbi, and I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No problem. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll jump in here real quick. We did get a, um, a typically the, the menorah gets, gets lit. They have an event. It stays up for a week down in the Robinson Plaza. Usually that's all handled at staff level. Um, this year, they are asking for a street closure so that they can still have their tree or their menorah lighting ceremony um, and um, have people there, but appropriately um, socially distance, which would require them or um, to have the street closed so that they can respect the COVID uh, the COVID nineteen mandates, and then they can. Uh, it'll be Union Alley to Broad Street down there by the plaza. Um, so the rabbi can jump in and, and add anything else uh, he wants. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's a very um, unifying event. Uh, there were quite a few Jewish holidays that unfortunately weren't able to take place in the regular way. We've got creative packages, DIY uh, um, uh, packages for doing Passover at home and so on. Uh, but finally, uh, the menorah lighting hopefully will be uh, 
an event where we're able to get together and the message of, of just spreading light and positivity out there uh, in a very, in a safe way will be very appropriate to finally be able to celebrate together even in this COVID era. It is outdoors, it's short, it's, people can be spread apart, you know, there's not, like it's, there's kind of nothing that, that seems to us problematic safety-wise, so we're hoping that we can go forward with that, you know. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Nevada City. Uh, um, you guys really always um, are very, very kind and accommodating for the Jewish community's uh, celebration. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment? Don? No, sorry, my little bar wasn't working. Um, <laughs> no, I don't have any public comment on this item. Okay, great. I'll bring it back to the table. Is there any council members would like to um, ask any questions? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to thank you both uh, for the presence of the menorah in town and um, the opportunity to uh, celebrate uh, the return of light uh, with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that it's wonderful that we support the Jewish community in this way. And it's really critical because they're an important part of our community. And, and I really appreciate that you folks are trying to find a way to celebrate at the same time and keeping safe. And, and I think that's a good example for all of us uh, in this day and age about how to make things work in the current climate when, you know, we can't congregate, you know, indoors as well. And, and you know, outside is, is the way to do it. So you guys coming up with an alternative, I think is wonderful that works for, for you folks and for the public and for the city. So thank you so much. Yeah, I, this is one of my favorite events to uh, attend and participate in each year. Um, and just be aware if you need any help from us, council members from the city in somehow assuring that we don't have groups gathered because this is a very fun, comfortable event it's cold. We're usually all crunched together on purpose. We like that. Um, but if you need help figuring something out on how we keep people spread out, please ask for the help and we'll find a way to give that to you. Um, but I look forward to this this year again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is um, I just, I'm really excited that you're doing it. I'm excited that it's going to be there. I think people, it's, it's hope right now. And I think we need that. And so thank you. And um, can I get a motion for the approval of this street closer, please? Yes, I move as soon as I find it. Oh <laughs> no, I spoke too soon. Okay, let's see. Um, I lost it. If somebody else has it, please. Oh, here we go. Um, I move that uh, to close the street for the fifth annual menorah lighting. Um, it, yeah, that's it, right? Application, yeah. Application, great. Um, that was a little clunky, sorry, but I'm working on it. That's okay, you did great. Okay, and Katrina, um, can I get a roll call, please? Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Manette? Yes. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, if um, it, it might have slipped between the crack last year, we needed to ask separate uh, permission for leaving the menorah up um, all week of Hanukkah. Can we include that? Yeah, that's we, you, uh, Rabbi. We 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 can do that at staff level. So you so you're fine. Um, we got approval from them last year, so we're just handling that the same. They just need to approve the street closure. Okay. So yes, and I hope you are yep. going to leave it up because I think that actually is a good thing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you all. Thank you guys for your time. Uh, we really appreciate uh, everything that you do for the community, and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you. Okay, thank thanks, you. Rabbi. Good night. Good night. Okay.
let's go back. What I do with that paper? Okay, so um, we're moving back to um, E is uh, reinstatement of two full time police officer positions. All right, council members, good evening. So during the first part of the year, uh, Nevada City, along with obviously all the other cities and towns across the state and country, were severely impacted by the COVID-19 shutdowns. Uh, during the first part of this year, departments within the city began looking at ways to cut uh, costs as we expected revenues to be significantly impacted. Um, part of the budget cutting process, the police department at that point had two open positions that had been budgeted for the police department uh, that we decided to freeze in the event of not having to furlough and or lay off any employees that were currently working. Um, and then over the last several months, the police department has experienced a significant increase in the amount of police officers needed for things such as truck rallies and vigils and marches and people in trees and things of that nature. So it's impacted the staffing levels that we have, which were already significantly down. Um, we also at that point had froze three uh, community service officer positions, which were all part-time. Um, so with that being said, we've relied heavily for, for all these events on our allied agencies, which we are extremely grateful for. Um, they've been with us to help us with staffing, which has come at no cost to the city. Um, but I think to expect that to continue to be that way would be um, hard pressed. I think that uh, in my position, filling those positions would be the key at this point to keep staffing levels up. There's been rumors of a couple of the members of our agency right now leaving the agency, which would put us behind. And I think historically, if you're not in the process of hiring, you're always going to be behind. And that's not a position that we want to be in. So in during the writing this report to council, we actually lost one of our sergeants, Luke Holdcroft, to Nevada County Sheriff's Department. So we wish him very good luck, but he's a, also a 13 year member of our agency. So he takes with him a lot of experience. So we have a very young department and I think that we need uh, the additional bodies uh, to maintain. So that's what we're asking to basically reinstate it. I think it's also very important with those positions, hiring and law enforcement is not a, a quick task. So anticipation would be at minimum two to three months to get somebody through a full background process psychological testing, medical testing, um, and polygraph testing. So even though we had frozen from for this fiscal year, which would at this point take us till July 1, um, we're still looking at probably February or March until filling those positions anyhow, best case scenario. I'm having a problem with myself in muting and unmuting tonight. Um, I'm gonna jump in and, and just add a little bit to what Chad's saying. Um, I, I did have some opportunity and um, I spent some time talking to Daniela. So um, Danielle asked some really good questions about how we've been impacted budgetarily uh, over time um, because of the, the lack of officers. So at this point, uh, we had a budget of about $35,000 for the entire fiscal year for um, overtime. And we are at almost 30,000. So um, if we were to continue going forward and project that uh, that fiscal impact each each pay period as we have, uh, we'd be upwards of eighty five thousand dollars at the end of this fiscal year, which would be fifty thousand dollars over our budget. Um, so that is definitely something that needs to be considered. Uh, straight time obviously is not as costly as overtime. And right now, looking at our regular time, because the um, because the positions are in the budget, but they were not slated to be filled for the fiscal year, we are on target right now at a budget of seven hundred and sixty-two thousand to be right on budget currently with the way we're per performing fiscally with regular time with our officers. So it would it would require a budget just adjustment that we would come back with for the police department. And as Chad said, with that lag time, you know, looking at uh, January, February for um, new hires to come on, that would, you know, that would require about a four to five month adjustment in, in regular salaries um, for, uh, for the department. Um, 
on another note, just going back to what Chad was saying and to really echo um, the stress that the that the 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 lack of staffing is is definitely potentially to cause. Uh, if we were to lose an, an officer or two more and to be behind, if you will, that two to three months or three months for a background check does not put the city in a good position. Um, right now, we only, ha we, we only have 12 officers uh, positions and those are sworn and that does include the chief. Um, Daniela, again, it, um, asked some really good questions when we talked on Tuesday and um, uh, I, it did draw me to go in and look at our budget. We do have 12 sworn positions that actually does include our chief and that includes our, includes our measure C um, um, officer. So right now we've got two vacancies, which leaves us with 10 sworn officers. And of those 10 sworn officers, one is the chief and one is the lieutenant that tend not to be patrol. They do participate obviously in the, in the, um, the things as the vigils and the trees as, as, that, as that's needed. But as far as on, on the ground out there in our city, uh, that's 10. And now with the loss of Sergeant Holdcroft, that leaves us down to, uh, let's see, what am I? I'm losing 12 to nine, right? Am nine. I nine? Nine. So um, that really does cut in. It cuts into what we have out there patrolling. And um, as we're, as, as you know, we continue to experience um, this uptick in issues that come that are coming through Nevada City that are controversial that almost um, seemingly have involved our uh, our, our um, police department in some fashion or another. Uh, it, it is very uh, distressful, especially for you know um, the police department, but also for me, um, not having that staffing there and the concern that there's that lifetime that if we need bodies we're a step behind instead of um, kind of being proactive at this point, knowing that um, th that that's there and that we've had to backfill with overtime. And that also has created for our officers some slight, uh, if you will, burnout, because although people do enjoy overtime, they're to the point where it's too much and, and they, they need to be home with their families and know that they've got those days off that, that they need to, to recuperate from, from what's going on around here. That's my, that's my, my rant. I'm done. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Katrina. The other, thing that I, the other thing that I did want to add for that is, you know, regardless of other incidents that come up where we need large amounts of staffing, we still have to adhere to, you know, state training and things of that nature. So it makes it very hard to cover shifts when we still need to send people to trainings people still need to have their vacations uh, for officer health and wellness and things of that nature. So um, all of those things included together, I mean, it just makes having those extra positions for coverage opportunities a lot better. Hey, um, <coughs> could, uh, do we have any public comment on this? Yes, we have one from Miriam Morris. What a rough time we're going through, what, but what an excellent time to evaluate how our police department can move forward to meet this moment. Instead of hiring new officers, we could instead hire a social worker, someone who is in a homeless intervention specialist who can be out on the streets helping connect those suffering from addiction and mental illness with available services. This would do so much to address some significant quality of life issues that crop up frequently in town, affecting everyone. We also need to create hiring committees comp comprised of community members and interested council members who can help make sure any new hires reflect our community's values. I'd like to remind the council the power to create change is in your hands. It is within your capabilities to shift the culture to a more community oriented focus. Lastly, with the concerning spike of COVID cases, could Chief Ellis explain what he and his officers are doing to help curb the spread within their department and their interactions with the public? Do officers wear face coverings? If not, why not? Okay, thank you. Um, Chad, do you want to address that? 
Yeah, so obviously, I mean, the social worker aspect of it instead of police officers is, it's important. That's one of the topics when they come up with defunding the police. It's not necessarily taking money away from a police agency. It's just reevaluating where money should be going. So what I can tell you is that the police department and especially Amanda at this point is working closely with the home team um, with a lot of their members to go out and deal with people with mental illness and suffering from homelessness issues and are working collaboratively with that. So um, that's an, an ongoing scenario. I mean, I, I think you're still going to need police officers out there and we're still shorthanded as it is. So that's, that's another conversation to be had. Uh, the COVID-19, I mean, obviously for, for all of us, Monday to have it solidified that we went up to the top tier was a shock to me. I didn't see that one coming. Uh, so I think we have a lot of work to do as a community. And I think that that's going to start Friday morning at 8 a.m. with all of us getting together and talking again about best practices and what we should do. So officers out in the community, we still are taking an educational approach at this point, um, but we'll see where that needs to go because we are having numbers increase. Um, so officers will be out when they're in public wearing masks and still trying to do the education piece, but we will continue this conversation. I hope Miriam can be part of it on Monday and at least listen in um, so writing. she can see the direction. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, any other co public comment? No, that was all the public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I would like to ask a, a couple of questions before I go on to the other council members. How many, what's our, what's the number of a full department for us? The number of what? 12, 12 sworn what? officers, 12. 12, okay, and. Uh, that, that is sworn officers only, that's not, that is not non-sworn, but sworn officers is 12. Okay, and that's to basically run our department on a 24 seven? Correct. Okay. Um, and I know that we don't have the highest pay or the greatest benefits. How hard do we, is it for us to find um, or recruit new officers? Extremely difficult. Okay. Um, though, are we kind of a, you know, like our fire department? Is it kind of like a training ground for... Do we tend to get, you know, officers right out of the academy or? Yeah, so it's it's half and half. Um, members of our department, about half of them have been there long term for over 10 years. And the other half are probably within two years of being in law enforcement. So there's definitely a mix. Uh, the trend that we're seeing, and I, it's not just Nevada City, it's Grass Valley and the county over the last several years is, We've kind of become a training ground because when you go to areas like Roseville and Rockland, uh, there is a lot higher pay and better benefits. So officers will oftentimes get employed by a small agency, get what's called their basic post certificate after one year of employment, and then look elsewhere. And you're pretty marketable once you have that one year under your belt. So if somebody can go to a different agency and make $7 more an hour and have a better retirement system, it's pretty appealing to them. So... Um, okay, I was just wondering because I know that we that's been a problem with the fire our local fire department too. So okay. It's been the um, thank you. Thank you for um those answering. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. move on to the rest of the council. Um Doug. Yeah, first of all, you know, I certainly appreciate the overtime that the, the police officers have been uh clocking lately, and, and I've certainly been there. For the tree stuff where you know they're all hands on deck and, and you know everybody was there and and they were needed and, and that wasn't easy for us because of, of staffing issues so so i appreciate that and and i also appreciate that you know our, our law enforcement with you know what what was been going on from the community after the incident on broad street uh the low pay the lack of good benefits it, it, it's a challenging time for for the the department and, and Chad you and I talked a little bit about that um oh and I'll, actually I've talked with uh officer Ewing and, and a few others about that as well um so what I, I like what you were saying in about you know 
the social worker aspect, and I know that doesn't solve this problem, but it's another component of, of this whole situation. And, you know, you have Grass Valley that has some kind of liaison out there doing some of that, or whether it's, you know, I don't know what Jamal's doing, but he's doing something. And then, then there's, you know, the county, the county, the sheriff's office is doing something. So, and I know we're a smaller agency, so it's good to hear that Amanda is sort of filling that position uh, as far as going out with the home team and, and going out when people are in distress in a mental, uh, mentally distressed kind of situation. So that's, that's really good. Um, Katrina, I think this is more for you. I, I want to understand the money a little bit better. Um, it sounds like we're going up um, on OT and way over budget. We're on target for staffing levels, right? Is, is that what I'm understanding? We're on target for the budget. We're on, so one of the categories within the salaries and benefits is just regular salaries. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're completely on target with our salaries right now with the two positions frozen. So the point I was making earlier is it would require um, a budget adjustment to the regular salaries to add the um, to, to add the money back tied into those positions that were um, were put in the in the budget is vacant, um, but it it's it's a different it's a different cost than it is to continue on with the overtime um, aspect to have those straight time officers in. Um, so budgetarily, I think it's it's going to work itself out. Um, pretty levelly if we make this this shift and and it will alleviate that time and a half that we're paying sure so is the if we staff these positions and stop the overtime are we going to have a net savings uh, on on you know what we're on what we're expending on law enforcement uh, I think in the end, we still will see somewhat of a savings because there's other categories within salaries and benefits that um, that we're experiencing, um, we're coming in under budget a little bit in some of the salary and benefits area because of the, um, the vacancy that we've had in that department, the vacancies we've kept in that department. And that includes um, also the non-sworn so the overall, I think in the salaries and benefits, if we stop the, the, the bleeding with the overtime and really concentrate on getting some you know, officers in here and uh, alleviating that time and a half that we will end up coming out still a little bit better than our budget with the overall salaries and benefits for the PD at this point in time. Now, Things could slip. I mean, we, I'm only looking at, we only have numbers through the end of October, obviously. Anything can change as we know at this point in time. And uh, I, I've seen more, I've seen more bizarre things happen in this last 12 month period than I ever have as far as uh, budgets. So yeah. no guarantee, no guarantees. If, if, if I had that kind of guarantee to give you guys, I'd be worth a lot, lot more money if that crystal ball told the total story. <laughs> and I think, I think I might be totally marketable to other agencies with that kind of crystal ball. Oh, I think you'd be marketable to the world with that. But uh, <laughs> so I, I appreciate that things change, and, and that's you know one of my concerns. Let me ask you a, a, a hypothetical question, uh, Chief Ellis. If you had the choice of staffing these two positions, and maybe three, or reallocating some of that money to provide better salary and benefits. And I know it doesn't work like this that easy. I, I know it's, <laughs> you can't do this, but just would you rather have your people paid better or more staff? I know you want both, but, <laughs> yeah. you know. See, see all the above. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I understand that too. So what, you know, my only concern with this is I think we need a fully staffed police department. And, and I think that right now, it, you know, and, and, and we have the situation where there's the lag time, we have another person retiring or, or transferring to the county, and so there's going to be some vacancies there. What I have a little bit of a concern about is the timing of this. Um, and, and I want to understand better, I, I mean, I, what I'm probably understanding is that it's the lag time and that we need to get this started now because it's going to take a while to get this process going. Um, but Right now we have 
two reports that are coming out about, about the, the police department. And we have the public kind of looking at us uh, right or wrong, you know, to see what happens with the after incident report. And, and well, they're not going to know about the internal affairs investigation. I think it would be good strategically, you know, for public perception that we get the report. The report's going to say we're understaffed, right? I mean, that's, that's probably, I mean, certainly on that day in question, we were understaffed and that's probably because of staffing issues. So we can use that report to really justify this even better to the public. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, and, and, and uh, you know, if that's a matter of awaiting a month or so, I think it might be worth it. I, I think it's worth, at least worth us, worth us discussing it. And I'm not in any way saying that, you know, I don't want you guys fully staffed or fully funded or, and we don't need to pay our, our officers better, especially with, you know, with some of the stuff that they're going through now. And that will make us more effective. Um, so I, I think that the timing is the only issue for me. And, and, and I don't know why now is the time, especially with all the COVID stuff going on, that might be another justification for having more uh, boots on the ground just with COVID enforcement. So, you know, Katrina, Chad, just talk to me a little bit about the timing and if you, you know, feel that this might be a little bit better received if we do it, you know, after those reports come out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, the reason that we're bringing it to you tonight is because it's time sensitive and we're at the point where we need the extra staffing. Fair and enough. so the pulse on the PD, I can tell you, um, the guys are working a lot of overtime and they're getting very tired. So the extra bodies would be a significant help. And they're still two to three months out at best to get those bodies in here. And that's not even counting if in fact we have members of the department now who are looking elsewhere as we speak. And if that happens, their only obligation to the city, which I would hope this wasn't the case, but is to give us two weeks notice. They give us two weeks notice and vacate their position. It's still going to take us two to three months to hire somebody uh, for that spot. So we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're extremely down. We're already down three full-time spots as it is right now. Sure. Um, well, maybe there's a scenario where we start the process with one or two of those positions and then wait. You know, I just, you know, I, this is more about the public perception and, and the, the sort of stuff that's going on in the community right now. I, I think we're being looked at very closely on some of this stuff. And I just want to make sure we do it right with the, the proper sort of positioning uh, for the public and the optics of what we're doing. You know, it, it's, you know, right or wrong, it's a tough time to be a police officer right now. And I, I feel bad. For, for police officers in general across the country and especially our police force. But we do have to consider the public perception of what's going on now. And, and I, I, you know, I, I really appreciate that this is gonna take a lag time and with three people, there's a concern. But if we could wait until that report comes out, I think it would just be a better, in my mind, it would be better positioning for us uh, as a community um, to, sort of tie those together and saying, hey, this was one of the requests and so we're gonna staff up. Otherwise it's, yeah, we, we need a lag time. We're right in the middle of this COVID thing. We don't know the, the economic impact that it's gonna have because if we're in uncharted territory and we don't know how long this is gonna last. So the same financial constraints are, I think are in play right now. And so the only, real reason I understand to do this now is because of the lag time and because of the fact that we just lost uh, another person on, on the force. And so we're really down three. So that's my two cents. I, I hope we can talk about this as a, as a council and sort of work through that, but that's where I'm at. Thank you, Doug. Um, can I just clarify something that um, Chad just said? Are you saying that we have a possibility of losing two more officers? which would take us down five. Did I hear you say that? So there's, there's, I've heard rumor as early as today that two other officers were looking elsewhere for employment. So that would take us down five officers. It could potentially. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Dwayne. Wow, um, anyway, 
I, I think the perception is is a little off here, and I don't see why would we would be waiting. I've been doing this now for 11 years, and I can't remember a time that our department has ever been fully staffed, truly. And we keep getting into this rotation, this cycle, this snowball effect uh, of, have, of being understaffed, which leads to subpar performance. The guys are tired. Their families are upset. They're not home with their spouses, with their kids. We can't have a professional quality performing department when they're not staffed. And this has never ended. It's this ongoing cycle. And um, that's why we're losing people and why we will continue to lose people. We can't keep asking them to work double shifts over time and expect them not to look elsewhere to the, the county or down the hill uh, to other departments that are paying better um, and asking less of them and less stress of them and their families. Um, and the perception issue, I think, with the public right now we are not growing our department. We're simply trying to dig out of a hole and get back up to ground zero so we can try to get a department that is professionally trained and performing uh, the way our, our you know, public wants them to. I also think that it's a misconception that um, the majority of our community wants to defund the police or trim it down. That's not the case. The majority of our citizens, if we look at our emails, they want a professional quality performing police department to provide public safety. And right now we can't have that. We can't make improvements or changes until we are fully staffed. This is simply trying to get us back to where we need to be to, to do a minimum amount of uh, policing. And the other thing is irresponsible, in my opinion, with our MOUs, other departments, both the county and Grass Valley rely on us as much as we rely on them. And if we don't have a staff department, we're not living up to our expectations and our part of that bargain. Um, when they need extra help and ex extra you know, boots on the ground. Um, so I, I think we need to move forward on this quickly. It has nothing to do with upping or increasing our police department size at a time that, like Doug said, he's worried about the perception. That's not what we're doing. We're simply trying to, to, to stay not just even above water, but just treading water. Um, you know, we, we can't keep putting this off. Um, it, it's been an ongoing cycle for 11 plus years that I've been here. Dwight, just to, to respond to that really quickly, I, I appreciate that. And I'm not saying that this is a defund the police thing. This has nothing to do with that whatsoever in my mind. And that's not where I'm coming from whatsoever. I'm just coming at it from an optics thing. And, and look, when you get down into the weeds, I agree that it makes sense. The way you position it, that makes sense. I just think that the public is not going to feel those nuances, you know, that this has been going on for a long time, that we're understaffed. And if, if you know, if we have been understaffed for the whole time, obviously it's been working to a certain extent because it's been going on for 11 years, as you say. And, you know, and, and things are. So I'm not saying don't do this. I am not. I'm just saying there's a timing issue for me. That's all I'm saying. So anyway. Thank you. Daniela. Yeah, I hear all that. Um, that's a lot of variables. Um, I'm also here, you know, I'm really hearing uh, Doug's timing issue. You know, I've gotten phone calls from constituents uh, that are concerned about the timing of this. You know, we just went into the purple tier. We, we all know that. Um, my uh, idea for the city that, you know, the, from what I'm hearing from constituency, from our constituency is that we need to shut the city down, right? Um, gatherings are going to slow down and, and um, uh, we're getting into cold weather. Um, we're getting into to, to deep COVID time. And I feel like the climate of our community is changing. You know, we just got, we got devastating news um, for that, uh, for the purple tier. And so I, I'm really interested in this, um, um, the after incident report as well. I think it's gonna give us key insight on how to build up our force. Um, and I wonder if it is uh, uh, premature to do this before we get the after incident report um, in, in light of, um, um, like Doug said, just the, the, simply the timing of it. Anything else? Danielle? Um, no, well, I was, I was also just, I'd like to throw this in there too. You know, I was thinking about um, Chief Goodspeed and how he was talking about he, he met um, over the last several months, seven meetings and committees to figure out a better way to move forward um, with the community in response to like our, our, our changing fire situation. Um, and so, I, I, I would love to see, you know, the hard work of getting input 
from the Firewise communities could be mirrored at this point um, um, so that we can best invest in law enforcement. And I would love to see something like that where we engage the community around that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I guess I'm more concerned about us being down five police officers than just two police officers. And because we are in the purple tier and things are still really crazy out there and there's a whole bunch, you know, and asking, you know, we don't know what's coming down the pike. And I also realized that maybe the optics aren't great. Um, Katrina, um, what, we're about two weeks out, maybe before that report comes in? Um, actually, I'm not sure how long it'll take him after. I think he's doing final interviews um, from the last email I got from him uh, the first week in December. Okay. Uh, so I think he'll be wrapping up interviews that week. And I, I, I'm imagining, it, you know, without having talked to him, uh, at least a two to three week uh, turnaround then on a final report would be my guess. That, and that's a guess, so. Okay. Well, I, God, I, you know, I feel like splitting this, you know, part of me says, yes, we should go ahead because it is a process. Um, also just finding people is going to be a process, but if we don't do two, I say we at least do one. And that would be my suggestion because we're putting a lot of pressure on the police that are there. And um, I don't think that's okay. Um, they aren't performing at their best and that allows for things to happen. And then we're responsible for that because we chose not to fill those positions. So, and that's where we become delinquent in our job also. And just to do that out of perception, I'm more concerned for the safety of our community. And Daniela, to, I just want to comment that I think your idea is a good idea. But remember, the whole fire department took a number of years to make these changes. It didn't happen in a month. And so I think that's a really great conversation to start having and looking at. But at the moment, we need to um, work with our departments and make sure that we are taking care of our citizens in the right way. I totally agree. And I'm not suggesting that anything is a, is a quick solution. I'm simply suggesting that a process with community um, in conversation, I think would be beneficial. And you know, Aaron, I, I would only add to your one officer that we revisited after the report um, so that we can, so that we can um, um, add as needed. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I'm nervous about even saying one because I'm thinking, you know, if we have a two week notice from two other officers means that we are down, that we are not um, covering a 24 hour shift. I mean, unless the, we have officers working, you know, seven days a week and really that is not a good, that's not a good thing. So I would like us all to just take a deep breath and think about this um, because I think it's really important if we're looking at being down five, starting to look for two maybe is the right thing to do. And I agree for you that we need to, you know, when the report comes in, um, it looks like we're going to have to be looking for more or maybe not. So um, I think we'll get a lot of political capital. What? I go with it. Um, I think that we have the political capital to spend um, on this. And what we have, I, I have to agree with you, Mayor and Dwayne. You know, I, I didn't understand the history of, of not being fully staffed. And in this climate, you know, I think, you know, anything we can do to help the officers that we have you know, not be burned out and, and be, you know, happy at home and all that, you know, I know they're working really hard. You know, I think we do have to make some kind of, uh, uh, you know, effort to allow the, the process to start since it's such a long process. Um, I would like, I would, I would like us to 
tie something into the after incident report. So it makes a little bit more sense, you know, but I, I, I do appreciate the conversation uh, and, and Dwayne's points and Aaron's points, as well as Chad and, and Katrina's points and Daniel's. Um, but, you know, I, you know, if we're going to be down three, that's a problem. That is real problem. Yeah. And so let alone five. Yeah, let alone five. And if, you know, and, and, you know, also, if we don't, you know, agree to this, those other two may go screw it. I'm out, you know, because, you know, we're not getting the love from the council. And, and so I, I think it's a snowball effect. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the fence and I'm on the side of, of approving, you know, this as, as requested at this point after the discussion. And, and right. Uh, so, and so for clarity, it just, I, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but we are down three officers right now. We yes. are down three. Yes. Right. So everybody's on the same page. Well, right. but we might be down five. Potentially, that could be the situation. Right now, we are, it's not just the two. Holdcroft is gone. So it is three now. I hear that. And I, I, I do think that's a concern. And I think what's happening right now, a transparent conversation about policing in our community, I think is fantastic. I'm happy we're having this. And I hear you, uh, Katrina, you know, overtime, overtime is exciting at first, you know, your paycheck is higher, but then eventually it leads to burnout. And, and burnout uh, doesn't make anybody safer and it doesn't make anybody happy. So I, I get and I understand that. And I don't want our police, um, I don't want them to feel that way. I mean, I don't want anybody to feel that way in their job. So yeah, I think that I, I, there is an optics thing happening right now. And I would like us to you know, continue to revisit this conversation, particularly after the report comes out. I know we will, um, but I also feel like we, we should, we should uh, give the police department what it needs to do its job. Great. Can I get a um, call for a motion, please? I'll do that motion. Um, I move to, here I am again. Okay, I move to reinstate uh, uh, two full-time police officer positions as requested by Chief of Police. Second um, again. I, yes. Wayne second it. Um, all in favor, roll call. Katrina, please. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Manette? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Chief Ellis. I, I just I appreciate that we could have that, like Daniela said, that we could have this conversation and just talk about a little bit of the nuances of this. But you know, we support you and and getting fully staffed. I mean, I think that's very important. Just just how we get there. I think. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you guys very much. Thanks. Thank you. I Okay, we're moving on to public hearing subject, a resolution of the city of Nevada City to establish a fee for stationary generator proposal that requires a conditional use permit to ordinance. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, this is uh, really in response to council's uh, direction to staff to consider a lower fee specific to generators requiring a CUP or conditional use permit per the new ordinance that was uh, recently adopted for generators. Uh, staff is recommending a fee of $500 for those genera generators between 20,000 and 50,000 watts. Um, that will pretty much encompass, I think, anything we can reasonably expect to, to, to come in. Um, I've only had one that was over that amount, um, and that was for the, the California Organics gr grocery store and restaurant. Um, the only one other business that I could think of that might have one that's that that's as large uh, over 50,000 would be SPD. Um, but I think now that they are on the um, the PSPS relief line or whatever, the one that stays, stays active. So um, I'm not even sure we'll ever get to anything beyond that. But I'm suggesting that if we do have anything very, you know, larger than 50,000 watts, um, those can be pretty loud and, and quite large, so um, could require special, you know, consideration by the Planning Commission. So I'm suggesting anything beyond that stay with our, our standard $2,000 fee, um, but this will encompass the vast majority, if not all, of the, the um, generator permits we can expect to, to see. Okay. Any public comment on this? No. 
Okay, thank you. Um, could, Amy, could I ask just a couple questions? So this is like people who want to have a generator installed to turn on their house, correctly? Yeah, oh yeah, and I should clarify that the, the, the $2,000 fee would only be for commercial um, generators over 2,000, um, over 50,000 watts, rather. But is this also like, we just bought a generator to, so we could turn on our refrigerator. So do I have to get a permit and pay $500? This is no so so with, with the, the previous ordinance that was passed, it um, outlined a procedure and this was only for stationary generators. So if you're having it permanently installed, if you're getting a diesel power generator um, that's that's portable, it, you don't need a permit from the city. So this is just for stationary ones that are there all the time hardwired into your, your house. Um, okay. so with with the ordinance that was passed, um, anything that was 10,000 or, or less watts would just be a minor architectural review. That's a staff level review. Anything between um, uh, 10,000 and 20,000 goes to the planning commission as an architectural review. Um, anything over that with this, with this new, oh, and, and sorry, the staff level would be a $100 fee. The architectural review level is a $200 fee. And then this would, um, the, we, we established a conditional use permit process for anything over 20,000 watts, but council had some concern about the $2,000 fee that's standard for conditional use permits. Um, and so this is just to kind of um, bridge that for, for just generators um, that are going to fall into that category so that they don't quite have the, as steep of a fee. Okay, it is, so in that, what does that fee cover? Well, that it, it will cover, so for a conditional use permit, we, we do have to do public noticing. Um, so it covers about five hours of staff time, which is uh, kind of the bare minimum for, for doing any kind of conditional use permit. So I'm sort of anticipating these to be, so, you know, pretty um, easy. The, the, first, the first few will probably, you know, take more of my time, but I'm expecting those to be sort of um, template uh, kind of based after a while, so not needing a, a whole lot of my time. Um, but I do, d you know, for a, con a standard conditional use permit process would be I distribute it. So several different agencies will have a chance to weigh in and um, provide comments if they have any concerns like the fire department. Um, and, um, if, you know, and then there's the noticing in the paper. That's generally between $100 and $200 right, right off the bat. So, um, okay. So that, just, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, other council members, Dwayne. No, I just appreciate the fact that uh, it's as reasonable as, as Amy could make it. Um, that that's great. So I, I appreciate her hearing what we asked and following through. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, we, we asked for this and you gave it to us. So thank you, Amy. Danielle? Yeah, I want to echo that. That's a much better price. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and can, so I have another question. Um, you know, in the wintertime, we're used to power outages. I am doubting that SPD would be, you know, when PG&E turns us off, that's one thing they can turn back on downtown. But when trees and wires go down, these restaurants and stores are not going to have power because they won't be able to turn those areas back on. So, you know, I'm not, there's a difference between a winter outage and a um, shutdown by PG&E. So I'm hoping they're aware of that. Yeah, well, and this, I mean, as long as it's an emergency power shutoff, not under the property owner's control, um, the, the stationary generators are, are, you know, they can, they can use them. Um, yeah. Yeah, they've got them installed. So yeah, you're, you're right. The, you know, as someone like SPD might, might need them, um, even, even if it's not a PSPS event. Right. Um, they will. I think I'm just saying that so the public hears it. You know, we're used to having PG&E shut us down, but we do lose power for other reasons in this area. So, okay. It's hard but to I'm remember what those are at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I get a motion, please? Um, sure. Uh, 
Okay, motion to approve uh, resolution 2020 next in order, a resolution of the city of Nevada City to establish a fee for stationary generator proposals that require a conditional use permit or CUP. Second. Second. Thank you, Doug. And roll call, please, Katrina. Council Member Fernandez? Yes. Council Member Fleming? Yes. Vice Mayor Strasser? Yes. Mayor Minette? Yes. Thank you. Okay, you know, I'm just gonna say that, you know, we usually, we try to be done by 9.30, but I'm very impressed that it is only 10 of 10 and we are very close. So thank you all, because um, we got a lot of work done tonight. Um, do we have any correspondence? Katrina. No. Okay, announcements. I do want to announce that today the Cash and Fields Project got the tax credits that we were going for. So, oh, wow. yes. So wow. we're very excited to um, have that happen. That's and, exciting. And um, set in on the meeting this morning. And yeah, it was great. So um, yeah, we're moving forward. So that's good news. Um, any other announcements? Yeah, I'd like to uh, just reiterate for those of us who, for those folks tuning in that might not have uh, seen the beginning of the meeting, that uh, this month, November, is Nissanon Heritage Month, and we ask you to join uh, the Nevada City Rancheria Nissanon Tribe and the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project, otherwise known as CHIRP, as they celebrate the month of November as Nissanon Heritage Month. Uh, check out their updated website, that's nisanon.org, and please consider contributing through their important GoFundMe campaign. Uh, they have a goal of $30,000. Um, and as you may know, uh, we recently, as a city, um, adopted a resolution to support the tribe's efforts for federal, re federal recognition. Um, and if you want to support the tribe, please check out their website and also um, if you want to support the tribe further uh, by implementing a land acknowledgement to open your meetings and events, uh, please reach out to Aaron or myself or Shelly Covert of uh, the Nevada City uh, Nissanon uh, Rancheria. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and I know we're having a special meeting on Friday morning, and I thank you all for making the time to do this. But I am going to say this to anyone who's listening from my heart about our community and our businesses is please wear a mask. Please let's, you know, take care of each other. And I know there's people who believe this, um, that wearing masks don't help. But I think it's the only way we're going to solve this problem. And our cases are going up here. And I think we need to listen to the science and the doctors. And so I'm asking you, please just care about our community and please wear a mask. Okay, city manager's report. Um, so some th things that are going on, I I'm still continuing to attend the, the chamber board meetings and the merchant meetings that are being held once a month. Um, I've been working closely with Gretchen and Jesse with the businesses on the changes with the tents as far as them sticking out in the streets and how it's affecting other businesses. Um, I didn't get an official ask, but I, I have had the re some of the retail merchants that would like to put potentially tents out with their racks of clothes out front during the holiday season. Um, that is something, and, and Chrissy can correct me, that I think that I can, um, if I got an official request, which I talked to the chamber board on um, Monday that if they did have a, um, if, if there was a cluster of retail merchants that really wanted to do this and they could all get on the same page with it, that if they could submit um, something to me in writing through the chamber that had a somewhat of a united and collaborative um, ask, that that something is the disaster, um, whatever that position is or hat that I wear right now, that I could actually um, go ahead and, and let them do and work with them on with other city staff and then have that um, decision uh, ratified 
by you guys in, in the appropriate amount of time to add to the emergency declaration. Um, but I have not got that ask yet. But uh, staff's been really open to doing our best to working with the, the, the businesses and um, the restaurants right now, since they are forced to all uh, do outdoor now. Um, so we've had some um, no issues with the tents and where they're at, but we're continuing to monitor that. Um, knowing that what I was told at the board meeting on Monday is that right now, um, those tents, pretty much the only tents that are available are the ones that are showing up right now that go 15 feet out into our roadways. Um, so we're, we're doing our best to, to, to help as much as we can um, without cre creating any public safety hazards. Uh, there, there is gonna be a very pared down version of Victorian Christmas. I think the chamber will be putting that out. They discussed that yesterday that um, pared down uh, version of Victorian Christmas was approved by County Health. Um, I don't know all the details of it, but that should be coming uh, forthcoming shortly. I think it's was really going to- Was that approved in the red tier or the purple tier? Good question. Uh, it, I, I think it was just, just approved, just okay. approved. So um, it's really just going to be kind of a, um, a beefed up, focus on our retail shops downtown with kind of a um, shopping nights on those 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 evenings that we would normally be a Victorian Christmas. Again, I'll get further detail and I can get it out to the council members once I have that from the chamber. Um, Dawn had a great idea and I gave her the thumbs up to go forward just to keep things cheery and holiday like, even though we're all, um, you know, um, having a, a deal with the, the purple tier uh, situation is we're going to put some lights up in the um, in the in the Pioneer Park on some of the buildings and the fences and out there just to keep it holiday cheery and like people that. can still walk through and look at that and that'll be in coordination with the chambers really trying to do um, a holiday spruce up for downtown and trying to encourage the retailers and the restaurants and everybody that possibly can to really get into that holiday spirit and make it look um, again, you know, um, cheery, everybody loves lights and, and likes that during the, the holiday season. So uh, the city will work with the chamber on um, helping really uh, push that in the windows for the holiday season. Um, I think that they'll, they're going to start a little earlier than they normally would um, with that, just, just because of the current situation and climate. Um, some other things that we're looking out on, there are some, some projects, some very necessary emergency projects on the horizon. Horizon. I just went with uh, Brian and Bill today and looked at um, the, the little side street um, off of uh, Spring Mill. Uh, there's a large, um, basically, wall and uh, structure that holds Spring Street up. And uh, just with this first rain as little as it was um we it's that wall is compromised at, or that infrastructure holding up that street is compromised so we're looking at about an 80 to 100 thousand dollar project that has to be done right away to repair that that section underneath spring street so we're working on that um just as far as where we're at in the purple uh for city hall um staff is going to keep coming to work uh, we will keep our doors open unless we see otherwise. Um, we have all of our social distancing, um, PPE availability, and we have our ballistic glass up in our areas. So um, we're going to keep doing our best to provide the service that our constituents are still looking for. And we uh, typically are, as I talked earlier, um, this is uh, November and December are the months that our staff takes a lot of time off. So we're down a lot of staff during this period anyway. So those of us that are here when the others are off uh, will be those covering to take care of the public's, um, the public's needs as we go into the holiday season um, and fielding those same kind of um, emails as far as concerns and complaints and um, assists that our, that our public needs still right now during this time. Um, I think that's basically it. I, I, I am starting a vacation on Friday 
um, my, my vacation will go from Friday through the Thanksgiving holiday. I will be available for the special meeting. Um, Laurie is off Thanksgiving week. Amy will be off the week after, and so will Dawn. Uh, so I think you're going to, if you've got things coming to, to us, um, I'll, I'll be sure to make sure that staff is putting messages out so you guys know who's here and who's not. But my cell phone is always on and you guys can, can get in touch with me and um, I can uh, shoot things off to other staff members as necessary. But uh, definitely just uh, going into the next five weeks, this is the time that staff is requested um, you know, uh, being out of city hall. Cause it is a, a, it is our downtime and we only have a couple of council meetings. So this is when uh, staff does choose to take, uh, take, a, take their, take their time off and recoup. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, any yeah. questions of Katrina before we, um, go to adjournment? I don't have any questions, but I just want to state, and I'm sure we all know this, but want to name it as much as we can support and put out there to shop local. I think, you know, this season, whether it's like, and we can talk more about this on Friday, whether it's a campaign or something like, I think as much as we can push out that message, um, the better. I agree. I agree. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, I am going to wish everybody uh, happy Thanksgiving. I know we're meeting again on Friday, but some people won't be there. So, um, and I'm going to call for a motion for an adjournment. So moved. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.